The amateur game has always been a big part in their lives. It's always the topic of their conversations and is constantly on our minds on a daily basis. Although it's not at a professional level, the amateur game is a working class sport at a working class level. Players put their bodies on the line, life's on hold, and have worked their socks off to be the best they can be from the top to the bottom of the amateur game. We live and breathe football and the amateur game has given us our best years in football. Both of us have come to the end of our playing days and want to sit and speak to the legends of the game, the legends in their world, to sit and listen about the careers and stories of the game we love. Welcome to our podcast. Three points, please. So this week I'm on my own. Um, Al's just been sent off. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, Lance Asina, ex-referee, um, over 25 years in the game. Yeah. Um, played in the Lens Scene League, ref the, in the Lens Scene League, fellow of love with football, would I say? Yeah, fellow of love with refing. I yeah. still love football. And Brian Tracy, yeah. Well, well, Brian. yeah. Brian. Cheers, lads. Thanks for having me in. So, Brian, you retired last year? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I resigned in uh, the end of October into November uh, last year. So, I'd done 16 years as a ref. Uh, decided to give it up uh, have loved football I played it in the Leinster Senior League I made my debut for time in Bonn at 15 years of age uh, played football with all the local teams from the time I was about 6 or 7 so have been involved in football ever since and kind of enjoying the break at the minute you know happy uh, with the decision yeah yeah absolutely it came time just to, to give it up um, refereeing can be quite difficult uh, it, there was a lot of factors in my decision the main one being my family uh, what got really tough was that uh, as a referee there's an awful onus on you to give the league your Friday night your Saturday day your Sunday day shortages of referees and I know I've added to it by stepping away but it was getting to the point where I wasn't seeing my missus or my young fella over the weekend and he's at an age now where like, I, I need to give him my time. Uh, not saying I'll never go back to refereeing, but uh, at the moment, 50 years of age, having given 16 years to refing, I just thought it was time to step away. And I'm sure we'll get into those little points as we go, you know. Do you think it's a thankless job, though, the referee? Like, as you said, you're giving up so much your time. We spoke about it on the podcast. Amateur players giving up a lot of their time, but obviously there's an opposite side where it's the referees doing the exact same yeah, thing. Yeah, I don't think it's a thankless job, and I and I always say I've had more good times in refing than bad, but it's when the small little things start to get to you, and it's not the 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 good parts. Like you can get out and have a game with lads, and you're you're controlling a a, a lot of people there and controlling a game. And um, it was just the small things started to get me repeated abuse from certain people repeat abuse from certain clubs being sent in to solve problems by the league and by the uh, the administrators and you're solving them but you're not doing yourself any favour yeah. um, I always when I played and I played at the top level in the Leinster Senior and the AUL even if the referee had a shocker in my eyes after the game I always went up and shook his hand and thanked him because without him we were 22 lads standing on a pitch without a game because I'm sure you've had this in your own careers a referee doesn't show up or something happens and there's no game and all your prep and all your work is gone and it's not a nice feeling so I always felt as a referee even if lads had it you know I, I, I always like to answer questions after games especially around key decisions I tried to when they were being civil with me but just come up and thank the ref shake his hand meaningfully yeah. don't do it in an aggressive manner don't do it and shake your head turn your eyes down do it with a bit of respect because we put in an awful lot of effort as referees. Like, I mean, I'm not sure if you know how much re uh, effort a referee puts in over the year, but there's four modules through the FAI. You have your league meetings, so your, your panel from the Leinster Senior League. You also have upskilling throughout the year. And then you have an exam, a fitness test. There's an awful lot goes into yeah. not just turning up on a weekend. So it got to the point uh, people didn't want to come up and, and challenge you on nearly every decision. And I think we have an awful lot of that to blame. It goes back to Sky Sports and Andy Gray on a Monday night. He had the machine with the blue and the yeah, red yeah. line and they'd, they'd go into the end to green. And I thought that was bad. But you look at what Sky is doing now with referees. They have a thing on a Monday morning or a Thursday called Ref Watch. It's throwing them under the bus, isn't it? They're going through everything. Now, you take it as a professional referee. They're well paid. They're put into places where they don't live. 
they're not dealing with people that they have to interact with socially and that's okay because they're getting big bucks and you know what there's a separation there between yeah yeah. if they were paying me that money I'd take the abuse all day long and laugh at them but when you're getting 45 quid or 50 quid for a game and you're walking into your local later that night and there's a couple of players that would then they still continue the abuse or if you're uh, after having a performance where you think you did well and someone wants to come up and give out about a throw in yeah and you're thinking like in the scheme of things it's just not worth it you know yeah I think um it's not defence mechanism, but if I make a mistake in the match, I'm not going to blame yourself. The boy, Don Pearson is playing, is our ref. You made that mistake. I was playing Parmas down there a couple of weeks ago. The ref, I tried to hold it at the high line. Yeah. The ref said it was onside. Could, could more likely was onside there. Straight away, I'm over to the ref. Yeah. He was off, he was off, he was yeah, off. Yeah. And my mind hoping to say, right, he was off to get me out of the hole. Yeah. So I'm trying to deflect onto him there, you know. And look, I can understand that it was a player. Yeah. You know, um, but what you have to realise is even with VAR technology and the height of ten millions of pounds worth of technology, they're getting decisions that are millimetres right and wrong. And we're on a park, like you could be in Ballyfermot in Markovic Park, you're giving offside from an angle that is not the best angle as a solo referee. Yeah. And even these lads with machines can't get the angle right. So what chance do we stand in a park? And then even when we go up to trios or when we play with a, a fourth official, they're still giving out about decisions. Yeah. I'll tell you a funny, quick story. Um, I was doing a match. I won't mention the, the two teams because it would be unfair. And I won't mention the assistants. But we were doing a match one night and the dugouts are on one side and my assistant is over on the far right. And there's an offside decision in about the 20th minute. And for the 20 minutes previous to that, the manager and the assistant manager of the away team were chirping at every single decision. Now, as a referee... Were you in the middle? I was in the middle, yeah. But as a referee, I'd allow a certain amount because, again, you can't keep interrupting the flow of the game and you've 22 men out in the park wanting to play football. So this is going on cheap in 20 minutes, 20 minutes, and the assistant on the far side made what I'd seen as a good offside decision. The only people that had a better view were behind him. So they would have had, they were in a little bit of a stand. They would have been looking across the line similar to him, but he he's keeping the second last line of defence. Well, the away side uh, dugout went absolutely rasher. Yeah. So I stopped the game and I ran over and they they have known me for years and I know the two people involved and I ran over and they're expecting me to give them a dressing down or maybe a card or tell them to sit down in the technical area and I turned me back and ignored them and I called me two assistants over and they're looking at me like I've lost the plot so I called me assistant down in the far end and I called the assistant over from the far side and they come over to me. Now, this is shutting down the game. And I just said to them, in full uh, hearing of the dugout, but not looking at the dugout, apparently where FIFA tell us to stand is not the right place, lad. So we're going to ref it from here, because obviously <laughs> this is the best view. Yeah, and all yeah. I heard over my shoulder was, you've made your fucking point. Get on with it. <laughs> now, again, as an ex-player, done a bit of management in my time, I understand that they're getting caught up in the game. When you have an angle on anything, you can't say for certain whether it's on or offside. So you either trust your officials or you just want to abuse people. And that's crept in. And I think that uh, Monday Night Football thing started it. I think Sky with their ref watch has multiplied that effect out to the point where everybody's an expert. Everybody wants to give you an opinion. And so you don't really get a good uh, understanding of refereeing as it should be. Now, I think... So a lot of education goes on and maybe we could have educated clubs a bit better maybe had referees go in and liaise with uh, committees yeah, or with management just to give the sense of what we're going to accept and especially your level of acceptance I had a very low tolerance for abuse first year or two maybe took a bit too much but I soon mopped that up yeah. and most of the top guys that I worked with in the Leinster Senior League they just don't take abuse because yeah. The way I look at it, if you walked into your job in the morning and started abusing your workmate to the level that they do, you'd be getting a knockoff HR very quickly and you'd be whipped up to have a chat. Exactly. It yeah, wouldn't yeah. last. So I don't see how it's acceptable. I understand passion in football, but I don't accept or want abuse. Yeah, very good, yeah. Mm. So yeah it- great point. I think this will be an interesting one, Brian, actually, for, for people to get a different perspective Yeah. of, of looking into referees and looking at them and with them in certain views, like what you're at the saying there, 
is when you ask, you, you ask those, like, when you said to us, just at least go to the referee with respect and shake his hand. Yeah. That's even that's even getting to me now as a player and thinking, kind of going, Jesus, the times now we've gone over to a referee and just shook his hand. That no, probably being pissed off at a couple of decisions and walking, and walking off. You know what I mean? Not in a yeah, respect. Yeah, no, yeah. look, I've, uh, most of the time, and especially now in my, in my elder years, no matter how poor I think the referee has been, I still go over and say thanks now. But that's probably only yet to blending into me probably the last few years as I get that little bit older. Yeah. But hopefully this will give an, uh, an insight now to, to players and listeners and spectators for the game as well. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That will probably have that on their mind now. Uh, Listen, you'll, get, you'll, get, you'll get loads of people willing to give opinion on refereeing. You'll get thousands of them queuing up to slag and lash referees. It's an easy target. Mm. But look at the line to get on and be a referee. There's not that many people on it. The FEI has a problem with referees coming in. Out of every sort of 50 or 60 referees that they train up, they're retaining maybe 5 to 10. So that's less than 10% really. Why are they doing that? Well, they just, number one, when the referee does a course, he's uh, not backed up fully by the FEI when they go out and start their refereeing. Um, it has changed to a lot of degrees within certain leagues because a lot of leagues realise the importance of referees and that without them, they're going to be snookered to fulfil fixtures so the league will fall apart. But a lot of young fellas are put out there. I've seen a lot of young lads down there these days that up, up, up in things and I only see a lot of them down there. No, yeah. only, only kids, like only yeah. 18, 19. So, but just good. I think in the guard, they do a thing where a lot of the players in the club will man kind of ref the games there as well so I think something that should be brought into the younger seven. years yeah yeah for the, the small games I think as well there's only my opinion there if someone's getting red hard for abusing a ref he gets brought in front of the, the committee he should be told like listen you're going to have to do a referee's course yeah. and, and then they, yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. And they, they get to the inside yeah, so absolutely, listen you, yeah. you get, instead of getting a three game ban they do the referee's course or do an hour uh, study on it or something I know it sounds silly and all that but if they can They'll understand the game better, you know, it's anything educating that, them. Anything that makes people understand, number one, the laws, because yeah. a lot of people that play football don't understand. A lot of players wouldn't understand yeah, the laws. they don't understand the laws. And it's like, changing we're, a lot, though. We're drilled on 50, it. Yeah. We're drilled on it. And again, the, the laws have little subtle changes every year. We're brought up to date every year before the season starts and then we implement them from the start yeah. of the season. And one thing that I've noticed over the years is that um, if you have a young referee start, right, so the Leinster Senior League had this policy and it was brought in about maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, they had a policy that you were given a mentor, right? So it was a previous referee or it was someone involved in the uh, running of the league. And you were meant to be watched within your first 10 games. So when you go out fresh from the course, you start refereeing your first games. You're meant to be seen by that mentor in your first 10 games. It took me at the start of my career when the Leicester Senior League had a little bit less good guidance and management. It was 76 games into my career before I was seen. And I remember going to a, a meeting and uh, one of the guys that was a mentor in the Leinster Senior League, I went up to him and I said, look, I'm about 50-odd games in, 50, 60 games in. I haven't been looked at. And he goes, that's a disgrace. What's your name? So I gave him my name and he says, uh, look, Brian, that's a fucking disgrace. He says, uh, we have a mentorship program and you're meant to be seen the first 10 games. I said, I know. I said, I was given a mentor. And he says, who was he? I said, it was you. <laughs> so the fella who was administrating it he didn't even, didn't know, your even name. know who I was. Yeah. So there's no follow on in that regard. Yeah. And like, I know now we have an awful lot of mentors now in the Leinster Senior League and they're fantastic at it. Yeah. Like you've old, old dogs like Shay Travers, you've uh, Frank, uh, Frank Fitzpatrick, he would have been one of the ex-League of Ireland referees. Really solid guys. They're following the young lads around and they're giving them a better base. Yeah. They're giving them the confidence to go on. And so I think if everybody in the FEI had that model really wanting to be pushed, then it would improve the amount of support for referees. Because if you think about it, you could have an 18-year-old lad decides, can't play football anymore, or I never really made it in football, but I think it could be a good referee. He does his course. And within the first few games, he's abused, he's abused, he's abused. And he's not backed up, or he's not given a little bit of coaching, or he's not watched to see how he's performing. And he could he could still be doing well, but all of a sudden he goes, nah, this is not for me. 
the amount of money and time that people have put into him and now he walks away you're losing a referee without him ever getting started and it can be difficult you have to be a certain type of person to be a referee uh, some people go into it to give back to the game which is the reason I did I played in the Leicester Senior League for about 14-15 years Was it always something that you were probably saying oh, I'd love to do that or? well just to go back to sort of near the start of my sort of career uh, when I left when I left school in 91 uh, at 17 years of age my mum and dad wanted me to go to college and I had loads of aspirations in, in life college wasn't really one of them but my mum and dad were mad for me to do it especially my mum so I said, you know what, I'll go to college. So I, I signed up for some PLC course. But about two months into the PLC course, I was playing for a local side called Time and Bond. And I was approached by an, a fella that was involved with Shelbourne Football Club. And he asked me, uh, would you like to come and sign for Shells as an apprentice? We're doing a FOSS apprenticeship. And How I old are you here? I was 17. 17. So 17 year old. And I was a goalkeeper. So I thought, 17 year old. Yeah, FOSS apprenticeship. So I think they were paying us £68 a week to play football. So I went home and I said, look, I'm after being approached by this fella from Shells. And of course, my dad's eyes lit up, you know. <laughs> Foss apprentice with, you know, a view to maybe go further on in the game. My ma was immediate. No, no, you're going to college. You're already in there and I want you to go further. Because she's very aspirational for, you know, going forward in education. education and, yeah. and I kind of regret certain things again as I get older, you do. But... Uh, my dad must have had a bit of a, a word with her, but the day later she said, look, me and your dad have had a chat and yeah, if you want to go and do the year with Shells on the FOSS, and if it comes to nothing, you have to go back to college. Yeah. But you have to put everything into it. So I signed up. We went into uh, Talca Park, myself, my dad signed uh, the FOSS forms with Ollie Bourne, if anybody remembers. Yeah, him. Hey, Ollie yeah. Shells. Madman, yeah. Absolute head case, yeah. but he was great. Great for us. And the reason the Shells got involved with that was they had a kind of a professional side at the time. The likes of uh, Gary uh, Howler, Gary Haylock, Mark Rutherford, Greg Costello. Some of their top pros, Bobby Brown was in it. Fred Davis was the goalkeeper, who I thought was nuts, but was a great goalkeeper. Gagan, there was his team, Gagan. Uh, no, Gagan wasn't there at the time. But there was a great group of players there, and they were looking to keep them as professionals, so they were doing nine to fives with us yeah so we trained during the week as fast apprentice and they got to keep going with their football while they were going on and playing full-time football yeah. so it was a fantastic experience as part of that you had to do a referees course so paddy dempsey who was the head of the uh I'm not sure what league he was it might have been ddsl he came out and done the referees course with it and a couple of the lads that would have been on the course with me um, they had some of them had been to England and had come back. Some of them were tipped to go over to England. Uh, they were doing the referees course and going, oh no, this isn't for me, this isn't for me. But I was like, yeah, I kind of get this and I, I loved it when we did the practice stuff and I scored really highly in it. And Paddy Dempsey said to him, he said, would you be interested in doing a bit of refereeing on, yeah. the, on the weekends for me? So I said, yeah, well, do you know what? If you get me set up. So I did about a year DDSL. And again, that was as a 17-year-old. But I had my own footballing career as well, so I couldn't commit as much as I would. And DDSL at the time, was it was difficult to, to referee, and the parents were, the sidelines were horrendous, you know. Like, you even see it today. I don't know if you just go up and watch kids' football. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some horrible things happen on a kid's sideline. And like you're talking about a kid in the middle, about 16, 17. They're actually still children, legally. And these are adults abusing them on the sidelines. So that that in my head said, well, no. Ugh, they, not they see that, sorry, right? because obviously that's, they allowed that opinion from the sidelines. But as you said, that was your child. If I was watching that, my son was in the game. Some screaming sound like that. You would want to choke them, you know? Well, so, yeah, that's the, that's the hard part. Like, some of it is bordering on child abuse. Yeah. And when you think about it, like, as a club, if you're watching people on your sideline doing that, you have child protection officers yeah. in all those clubs. They need to start thinking, this could get out of hand someday and we'll end up in front of Tusla or, you know, the FEO will have to pull the trigger because they're very, very particular in that, you know, you have your Child Protection Act and all that. So i done it for a year uh, with DDSL. Uh, the thing with shells didn't really work out. Uh, my dreams were shattered. <laughs> I thought I was going to make it. But it taught me an awful lot about the game. It taught me an awful lot about my own goalkeeping and I kind of progressed because of it. But that's where I kind of got the idea of being a referee. 
and then when my career was at an end like so around when i was 32 33 i started getting hamstring pulls quad pulls you know shoulders were getting injured elbows so i got to the to the stage where i'd be playing one match i'd miss two through injury yeah i then go out for a six week stretch with a tear or, or a calf or something so i got to the point where i just said look i really can't play week in week out the stress of that was too much and i just thought one day do you know what will i go back and go refereeing so there was a beginner's course which i had to sit again because i I'd let the license lapse yeah and i went and i sat that and i did 16 years after that so it wasn't a it wasn't a bad thing you know mm. so Good. they were all linked in but it was always being part of football yeah and i think that's important because you do hear that one Referees don't understand the games. They were never, never players. Played it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An awful lot of referees, and especially Leinster Senior League, would have played at the kind of top levels. The difference is, when I turn up to Crumlin or Bluebell or Wayside, they look at me as a referee who doesn't know the game or hasn't played the game. But they don't remember me from my playing days because half, half of them weren't born. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I played with Bluebell. I played with Wayside. Yeah. But nobody... No. You know, maybe Pete Lennon remembers me from mm. the playing days when I was up there for a short stint. Players aren't. But the players don't. So, like, again, that's down to the, the communication. Like, not that you should have a little badge that says, I once played the game, but the fact that they should know that you played the game, it should make a difference to how they how they treat you. you know? Well, people have the perception of you before the game starts that he hasn't played, I don't know what he's ta- talking about. Any, any mistake or any decision you make from then on is going to be, in their minds... You don't know the game, of course. Yeah, so it's they already have their mind made up before. So yeah. you could have played for the, one of the best teams in the country, and they, they wouldn't give you that respect because in their minds they're already already right. You know. But look, I, I can respect players who play at a high level. I can respect elite type players. You know, I've refed an awful lot of war, absolute world class players. I couldn't believe that they were playing at that level because they were way better than some of the people I'd seen in Division One or League of Ireland. I loved when I went to a ground and. Like tech was one of the grounds where if you're in the referee's dressing room, you can hear everything that's going on in the home dressing room. And I used to love when he'd go in and get me bag. And I was always there an hour before kickoff. I'd go out and do the pitch inspection, get me kit ready, fill out my documents, get the books in. You know, everything yeah. was always tip top. But I'd love when I'd go into that dressing room and I'd see them coming in from their warm up. And I used to love hearing through the wall or over the crack of the team where they say, now you know what this fella's fucking like. Yeah. Don't say ant. You know? <laughs> Let him get on with ref in the game. And I kind of developed that over the years because I didn't take shite. Yeah. And if someone gave me shite, they knew what was coming. Yeah. So a lot of it was not that it, I put you'd, a stamp on it. You'd probably take that as a compliment in some ways, would you? Have, Absolutely. Yeah. Because I think they realised that all I wanted to do was get a game of ball played. Like, I know people, <clears> and again, you see this with the country teams, right? So, Intermediate Cup. It's the best cup to ref I've ever been involved in, right? You get teams coming up in Cork. Again, you might earwig this on the way in, you know. Ah, we will get none off the ref today, lads. You know, so they, they're already off to it. And the same one, like, I played with Bluebell in the intermediate, and we went down to Cork, and that was the talk on the bus. And the, I remember going through Fermoy on our way down to Rockmount and being told, we're going to get fuck all off these refs down here, so don't be getting stuck in. Let the football do the talking. So there's that misconception. I know any team that ever come up to Dublin to the Intermediate Cup, and I've done them all. I've done all the Cork teams, done all the Galway teams, Sligo, you name them, Donegal. I've always gone into the dressing room, and my opening piece them was, lads, play to the whistle, mind your language, mind your tackles, and please remember, I don't care who wins this. I'm here to enforce 17 laws, and you'll get a fair crack off me. Yeah. And I always seem to settle them. You know, I've often walked off a pitch amongst a crowd of Cork lads who've just lost a game and they say well fair play you give it you give yeah, an honest it. opinion yeah. and I don't think I've ever been called out as being unfair or biased towards a team just about to ask that question do you, do you, have, team, do you, have, do you have a feel like or someone's getting a bit of guff would you think you'd lent another to the other team or something so what, like in decision making it's, like it's a very complicated yeah. question because it might seem simple where you say yes or no right so Shay Travers I mentioned him a little bit earlier uh, he was known as the Rottweiler. That's what we called him in, in the Stanaway training sessions. But Shay Travers always said this to me. I did a tournament about two years into me, uh, my career as a ref. And he said to me, uh, I was talking about an incident the previous week with a player off one of the teams. <coughs> and I said, do you know what? He really got to me. 
And I said, again, just a comment on the way out of the pitch, I said, do you know what? Next time I'll ref him. Yeah. He'll see the real me, you yeah. know? I'll give him nothing. And Shay pulled me up and he said, no. You go back out there the next time and you start from scratch him. Do not carry anything yeah. into a game. <clears throat> and I was kind of stopping thinking, yeah, well, you know, does that make sense to me? And when I thought about it a bit deeper, it did make sense because if you go out with a prejudgment on how you're going to treat someone, you let it cloud your decision. Mm-hmm. I always carried that with me through my career, and I never made a decision that I was premeditated that yeah. he wasn't getting anything yeah. until the last couple of weeks when I was getting close to finishing refereeing. But you probably didn't know you were going to finish refereeing, did you? Do you know what? For a, a build-up of about four yeah. weeks, yeah. yeah. I did. A lot of stuff was getting in on me. Um, it was starting to affect me home life. It was starting to affect me me approach to the way my games were going. I always had a, a, a carefree approach in that. I wouldn't, like, some referees in their league, they know every player by name. You know, they'd ask players, ah, how's Margaret? Is yeah. she getting on well? They'd know everything about them. I didn't. I tended to know one or two names. I tended to know who played where. You know, if you ask me about teams that I refed, who I liked, there's very few players that stand out to me because I like to try and remain impartial. Now, I can't speak for other referees. Does that influence their decisions? It possibly could. But for about 15 and a half years, I never let it influence me, never let it change a decision. But then I got so, I won't say narky, but it was, I just had this feeling inside that I was ready to finish. The league was struggling with numbers of refs. So, like we were doing two Friday, two on our Friday night, two on a Saturday. And then one on a Sunday, just to make sure the fixtures got played. Yeah, you're getting a bit burnt out. You're getting narky. You're getting tired. And I remember going out to do one game in particular, and uh, spoke to a few of the lads in the dressing room while checking that gear. And I was in great form going out, but their centre forward, who uh, fabulous footballer, and uh, he just he said to me something on the way out. Better give us fucking something today. You were brutal the last week. <laughs> And that moment in my mind, it just went, right, you're getting fuck all. Yeah. Now, that had never happened before on a game. I'd never had that thought. Yeah. I'd never, never gone out with that idea that someone was going to just get. It sounds like you had to have been worn down, just maybe too many games. And- yeah, do you know what? Probably tired. Yeah. Probably a little bit too much refereeing. You can give two good games a week. After that, you're gonna your standard is going to drop. Your yeah. ability to be in the positions is, is dropping. And did you know this person? The striker. Yeah. I knew him through having ref him. Yeah. And he was always like a little buzzy bee in your ear, you know. Every decision that went against him, he gave out. Every every decision you gave, like an offside, even... And again, I would have had assistance that day. Offside, and he, he'd always have, oh, for fuck's sake, you know. No matter what, he just had this knack. But I never let it affect the decision. I always gave the decision based on law. But I'll never forget that day. Uh, I was working with uh, one of my buddies in the league, and a ball went in between him and the centre half, and the centre half went through him for a short cut. It was a real. The way I describe it is, you know, there's those old centre halves yeah, who used yeah, to take the yeah. ball, everything. He went through him. Now I mean, with the ball, that won the ball. The defender, not even slightly. <laughs> he no, not even slightly. <laughs> but he took him everything. But the ball hit the striker's head, and I just played. Now yeah. everybody on the park could see that it was. If not a yellow heading up towards that amber card where we have to start thinking reckless or excessive yeah. force. And in my head, which was the first time he crowd said, fuck him. <laughs> and he buried, yeah, really now I mean buried to the ground. And I just waved play on. And I remember a half time. Now there was a bit of giving out from the sideline, but as soon as could play, you know, this is what's happening. They were all, oh, maybe had a bad view of it or whatever. I had a great fucking view of it. But I remember me buddy coming over at half time and he says, eh, that tackle between the centre half and the, the number 10, why didn't you give a free kick? And all I said was, because fuck him. <laughs> now, that was where, again, we had a good chat after the match and I was kind of had a chat with myself on the way home. I was thinking, no, Brian, you've let yourself down. Yeah, yeah, first yeah. and foremost, it's you've not let yourself you, down. Yeah. And it was probably wrong of me to do that on the player. Now, I have to say, it solved a big problem for me. Didn't open his mouth for the rest of the game. Yeah. He got on with every time I played an advantage or if I, you know, let a tackle go. He just got on with it. He might have learned something from that. Yeah. But I definitely dropped my standard. And that was about four weeks out from just heading off and 
like that was one of it that was one of the contributing factors as to why you know mm. did you ever make a mistake in the game uh, did, like, would you bring them home with you so if you if something say like you gave a panel or something and it was would the body out when you got home or would you think about it much I was always good at reflecting on stuff yeah, yeah. but I always realised that you get one look at it from one angle you know um, I don't know if any of you did or remember doing trigonometry in school yeah if you think about <laughs> but if you, think, if you if you but if you think about triangles and angles and where things are like my view from here is very different to your view from there and so on and you have a different view than me and one thing that I always done was could I have been in a better position could I have taken a bit of a look over at the assistant was there any way that I made a mistake there and I was always one for good self reflection now at times after a match it's not the place because sometimes you have a manager who comes at you Sometimes you have players who want, can I, the famous one is they, uh, can I ask you a question? And you go, yeah. And then they give you a statement. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So you preach to you. Yeah, yeah, part of that education is, well, you ask, could you ask a question? And that's not a question. Then that turns into a bit of a battle. So I always like to give them five or 10 minutes to cool down, especially after a very important game. But I've had occasions where managers have just burst through the door wanting to tell me where I went wrong. Now, you could have had 90 minutes of football where they didn't score. They lost one nothing. The goal was nothing to do with me. But they'd be giving out to you about a throw-in you gave in the 95th minute. That should have been theirs when it was the others, you know? So, it's easier to blame other people, as I said. There, yeah, you know? I so. mean, everybody looks for a little scapegoat. Yeah. I always thought I was honest. Although, I've been told by several people over a point, they thought I was a robbing bastard. <laughs> but I always tried to be honest. I always tried to give the best of what I had on the day. If you think about it in a... Leinster Senior League, say on the card alone, 22 players, right? So 11 each side. You've got seven subs on each, and you've got seven people, so managers, assistant coaches, physios, medics. You've all that. That's 50 people you're trying to control in some way, shape, or form. And then you have the, the spectators behind them. Yeah, and the spectators are like... Probably they, worse. They can be. Like, I've often seen it at matches where fellas come out and they're hurling abuse at referees from the ditch from the sideline or whatever you know and that to me was always difficult because you can stay at home and abuse people now on the internet you can do it from the comfort of your couch with a headset and you can go onto all these websites and twitter and all you can throw all the insults you wanted i just don't think there's a place to have that con the referee can't be that wrong and you know maybe in the next couple of weeks go to a couple of games and just listen to how many times people blame a referee or they scream referee for fuck's sake and the same decision that they give out about the opposition are going no he was right mm. so there's always that flip side there's the neutrality in the middle and that's the only person you can really have that trust in is the ref and I think that trust is being eroded I think that got Troy said to me to ask that's to say to you a penal in a cup final or something you said, you said it's one of the best penal calls you, you had uh, Deco set me up there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> was that against Mayso? Was that against Ross Samro? Was it? Uh, it wasn't no. against Ross Samro. I think it was Mayso in goal. Right. Uh, or maybe it was the fellow. Well, obviously Ross's team Mayso. then was it? He I may, remember the match. It was. He uh, must have made sure he got on to you and me. So yeah, far, did he? Yeah. It was Wayside against Dublin Bus. Ball went flying in, and from where I was standing, right. And again, I got one look at it. Uh, from where I was standing, it looked like the keeper came out, and as the attacker got the head to the ball. The keeper buried him with the, the fists. Now, again, if you ask Darren Sheridan, who was the Dublin bus manager, he'd tell you it was the best decision ever made on a football <laughs> football pitch. Um, but I made that in all honesty. Yeah. Uh, I, I did it out of uh, wanting to get the right decision at the time. Now, in reflection, if I got another look at it, I could have made another decision. But I gave the decision that I felt was right at the time. Now, let's look at the overarching thing after that uh, I had to send someone from the dugout I can't remember exactly who that was I then had to send the centre forward off wayside off it just it escalated I sent committee members who were involved in the dugout away because they just allowed themselves to get into this uh, spiral of abuse Yeah. and no matter how bad that decision was or wasn't and I still to this day and Deco Deco slags me all the time I talk to Deco nearly every day he always says to me, oh yeah, that fucking decision. Darren, Darren <laughs> loves you, but uh, Pete Lennon or whoever was, I think it was Pete, was it Pete that was in charge? I think Pete might have been out getting his knee done at the time. But uh, like, I, I give it in all honesty. 
Now, I think Deco was my assistant that night. He didn't help you out at all with sounds of things. No, but he he says from his view, he didn't see contact between the keeper and the, and that's what I'm saying about the angles. Yeah, yeah. It's one of them. Now, I have to say, and it wasn't something that I, I don't go looking for this, but my brother-in-law that night, he sent me a text saying, what the fuck happened up in Wayside? You're being slaughtered on Twitter. Really? So somebody from Wayside put out a general comment about, I think it was, uh, I think it was something like, I don't know why referees do it. I couldn't put up at that level of abuse or something like that. I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but loads of people weighed in on it. And some people that were involved in the club and some people who were actually active on uh, Wayside's uh, committee. And I, I, I remember the brother-in-law sending me screenshots and I kind of stood back from it and looked at it as if I was a viewer from outside. And I said, well, that's that's actually continuing the abuse. Now, I know the league dealt with it. And I have to say, I was back up in Wayside uh, within the next three or four months. They tend to keep you out of those places if there's a bit of a, an issue or if the, the club feels that you have done them. But I went back up to Wayside and I've never had a problem. Like I played for P for about four or five months uh, back when I was about 19. Yeah. Um, it was one of his first years in charge up in Wayside. So remember the old goal and ball pitches with the, the wooden changing room up there? That's, that's where I was. But... I actually love Wayside as a club. I think they're fabulous for their local community. Brilliant club. Uh, I used to love going up there because the facilities are amazing. Um, I know I wasn't welcome with open arms a few weeks after that, but like I've been back up there ever since. And like I know that I gave a big penalty decision up there uh, about two years later. And Wayside were my best friends that day. Yeah, you know, so it usually listen, goes that way, doesn't it? It's, it swings and roundabouts. Yeah. And even at that <clears throat> match, uh, we did make an error as a trio. Uh, the 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 match where I went back to to Wayside, um, my assistant told me that it was definitely number six that made the second cardable off- offence, and I went over and six was already on the the card. And I said, "Are you sure it's six? Yeah, 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 I am. Yeah." And I made the mistake of not. I I could have thrown him another little bone that might have gotten to make the decision right, but there was uh, two brothers. I'm not sure if their twins were playing for the the club, and. He just looked at the face, right? And they're they're nearly identical. So I issued the second yellow and the red, and he went off. And it was after the game when I I'd, this is in the second half after the game. I said it to him. I said, "Look, eh, you do know your man's brother plays, and they're they're spitting the image of each other." He goes, "What?" <laughs> and it just clicked in his head. <laughs> your man was number nine, right? So he mixed them up, right. but in his head he looks the same. It has to be the same player. Who were who ready? Who was it? It was Killing the Manor. Killing the Manor. Yeah. Mm. The the two brothers two running gym up in Tala. But they're very very similar. Uh, so in the dressing room afterwards, when I said, "Look, you're telling me now you got it wrong." Yeah, I think so. So he said, "Right, I'll go outside and I'll have a chat." So he went out and I spoke to Paddy from Killing the Manor, the the fellow who looks after all that gear. Great fellow, great club man. Um, I said, Paddy, look, I think we have an issue. And he says, yeah, Brian, I think you have spotted what you've done wrong. I said, Paddy, nine and six. He got he got them mixed up. Yeah. So I said, look, unfortunately, can't change the decision now. All I can do is rescind it in writing. But nine will get a yellow card. And then I'll inform the league of what has happened. And, of course, the ban doesn't happen then because six has only had a yellow. But it felt bad then because we, we gave them about 15, 20 minutes with 10 men. Right. All because of a little error. And errors do happen, you know. Happens human error, yeah. 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 Of course, yeah. Of course, definitely. This episode is brought to you by Eco Pro Power Flushing. Is your heating system not working as efficiently as it used to? If so, then it might be time that you get yourself an Eco Pro Power Flush. Eco Pro are one of the most trusted experts in power flushing and also offer other services such as boiler fitting, lime scale removal, and reverse osmosis. They'll rid your system of any sludge, rust, or debris, and will have your home heating system working to its full capacity. For a warmer home, call on 085-831-6372 or contact them via Instagram or Facebook at ecopro underscore power flushing. So we'll go to the touched on that you played a bit, um, Brian. Yeah. Where did that start? Or so I started, off, go? Me lo- started off my local team, Millmount United. 
was about six or seven. Two of the local dads started the team. My own dad got involved in it. And uh, I always, I was a bit acrobatic when I was a kid, always jumping over stuff. So goalkeeper seemed like the obvious road for me. So I was a goalkeeper most of my career. Some would say most goalkeepers should stay there because they all think they're strikers. But yeah. uh, I had a little go at being a striker and quite successful at a certain level. But um, at 15, I went to Time and Bond. Um, they played in the Leinster Senior League. And I made my debut in the Leinster Senior League at 15. I don't think you can play in the Senior League till you're 16. But uh, back then, they, they never checked that, you know. Um, played for them for two or three years. And then, as I say, I went to Shells as a, as a <coughs> false apprentice. I'd like to say semi-professional, professional footballer. Sounds yeah. bad. Yeah. But it was, it was fantastic. It was being paid, you know, money every week to play football. So and it must have been de- half decent, so... Well, I was always a decent keeper. I had a streak of madness that would have, you know, messed me up. Uh, the manager, the manager of Time and Bond, we were having a brilliant season, and again, it was the DDSL Time and Bond. I was on my way out to play a match out the north side, and on the way out of the dressing room, the manager says to me, "By the way, there's a scout here from Leeds and a scout from Derby. Radar's on you." Who was it? She shouldn't have told me. Head, head, head went to that. Oh, I fell apart. Fell apart. My dad was out watching me that day. And I remember when I come off the pitch, I made I made two huge errors. They'd be the type of errors where if anybody is interested or thinks you have a future, they're looking going, Oh, he's a liability. Yeah. Um I remember one of them uh I made a save. Great, great save down to me right. And the ball is now rolling out for a corner kick. And I think I'm gonna get up and stop that. So rather than going after the ball and trying to kick it out into touch, I decided, you know what I'll do? I'll dive over it, somersault keep- over it, and I'll flick it back out into play, thinking this will impress the scout. I'll flick the back straight into the centre forward's feet and he stuck it in the back of the net. I thought a few quid on, on yeah, him at the score. And, and to be honest with you, I remember my dad in the car on the way home because he used to have a little van. He'd give about 14 players a lift home. He said to me, what were you doing? And I said, no, Tommy, Tommy, Tommy going out that there was a scout there. I tried to impress him. He said, you definitely impressed him. <laughs> <laughs> you let the last impression on Yeah, yeah so yeah. Like, I, I, I kind of went from there. Uh, I played, I, I, I eventually, after my false apprenticeship with Shells, I went back to college. I decided I'd do a degree in electronic engineering. So your ma was right, give up the football and stick yeah, to the college. Yeah, you know what, my ma always had a good solid head. She always believed in education and now as an adult, I firmly believe in getting yourself yeah. some sort of qualifications along the way. But I went to uh, Tala IT for uh, four years and I ended up playing for the Irish Colleges team. I went Very to good, France, yeah. Spain, England, played in a, a Regions uh, match in a place called Strasbourg. And like it was a huge yeah, like, was. forty thousand seater stadium. Now I think there was about two thousand in, but it was great to be involved in it. Uh, then I got picked up by Wayside. Wayside had a goalkeeper and he got injured, so they only had a reserve. So I was looking to move from a team. So Wayside took me for about four or five months, and then I don't know if you remember um, Philly Campbell. No. So I remember Soupy Campbell that played in the League of Ireland. He would have played with Galway United, you know, won an FEI uh, Cup. Well, Phil Campbell was the manager of Bluebell, and he also lived on the road behind me, man, does. And uh, he had I was a decent keeper again. He needed a cover for. Uh, Is that where you're originally from, Brian? I'm from from Bluebell. No, I'm from Tala. Right. So Phil Campbell lived on the on the back road, and uh, he spoke to me dad one day, and he says, "Look, I'm looking for a, a backup keeper to a, a goalkeeper called Sean Coffey." Sean was a him and his brother were two bluebell stalwarts. They're great, great footballers. Learned a lot from them, but uh, they signed me up. Uh, I transferred from Wayside. wasn't getting in at the first team, and so I went down to Bluebell and I spent a year and a bit down there on the uh, second team. I travelled with them. I played in one intermediate cup match because Sean was injured. Uh, I was on the bench for the cup final in Richmond Park against Wayside. What was uh, that in? Uh, intermediate cup. Intermediate cup. Yeah, intermediate cup. So I thought, this is it. This is for me. Leicester Senior League. And then Phil Campbell was sacked. And the new management team coming in had a few players coming from their old. I don't know. Team. Yeah. And at, I think at the time I was 21. Still very young for a goalkeeper. And then just a chance meeting with an old buddy of mine. He said he was involved with a team called Markovic Celtic. They played in the AOL Premier League. Really? So he said, look, would you come over and think of signing for us? So I spent four years with Markovic Celtic. 
Had Good some, out for back then, Mark. Yeah, they were great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we we had some ex Irish internationals, like junior internationals. Mm. I played with them. We uh, got runners up in the Premier A. I think I had the most clean sheets in the Premier A that year. But I think I John Mullen, who was an ex Irish uh, junior international, and Noel Ballard, who would have played with Coventry. They were me two centre half, so it was actually it was handy enough work for me, you know, compared to having lads letting balls through. So yeah, I, I played with them for a while and then I decided a mate of mine started up with it, started playing with a team and it was just a, a boys uh, Saturday football team. The commitment with Markovic got more and more and more. Yeah. And it just got to the point where it was it was too much. I was travelling down to Rings End for training two, three times a week and I was tired, just didn't want to get that much effort into it. And then I I said to me mate, I said, would you be interested in signing me as a striker? So, you know yourself, the old lad is all goalkeepers think they're strikers. I went into Cherryfield United and I had had a load of great years with them. Uh, We won cups. Now, it was Division 3 Z. A win's a win. But I was with a load of mates. You know, we train once a week. We had a manager who was the best drinker on the team. Yeah. You know, after the match, we'd go down to either the Submarine or or Freehills or one of them places and we'd have a few points. We we did everything together. We were just a good bunch of mates. We had some wonderful times. I took it over with another fella for a year because the manager got sick and we ran it for a year. From the drink, was it? Uh, (laughs) Well, maybe his liver had a bit of an issue. But again, like it was just good, good crack. And then I joined the fire service when I was 26, nearly 27. And the district officer who trained us was the manager of Manortown United. And he caught me at a weak moment and he said, I believe you're playing up front for a, a Division 3A Saturday side. So yeah, and he says, uh, I have a senior one Sunday. Uh, I need a goalkeeper. I've heard you're a goalkeeper. Yeah. So him being my district officer, I couldn't say no. He was going to pass me out as a firefighter paramedic, or he wasn't. Yeah, yeah. So I signed for Manortown then, and uh, first season with them, we came toured in Senior 1. And they only promoted two that year. So he missed out by a point. And I remember the, the speech he had in the dressing room ad was, lads, next year we take everything. And we were a good alpha, you know. Really, really solid footballing team. He had a great uh, theory behind play. He was one of the quietest men on a sideline. He'd give you your instructions beforehand. He'd let you play, you know. Uh, and then... During the summer, the committee decided he wasn't for them. They had a, a better plans of what to do. So they sacked him. And then a uh, new fella came in. And I have to say now, I, I really liked him. Uh, he he had loads of ideas. He was really all the chat, all the talk. Uh, he's, still re- he's still managing in the Leinster Senior League today. Mick Milgan, the Scottish yeah. lad. And uh, he got us in, and I'll never forget the first meeting with Mick Milgan in the, the community hall down in Manortown. He walked in, I have to say, sharp dressed, you know, ex pro, played a bit of uh, Scottish league football. And it was, it was hilarious because at the time, like, uh, I was at the putting on a bit of weight, you know, and uh, he walked in with a weighing scales. <laughs> and he's, uh, and it's a really poxy Scottish accent I'm going to do with you guys. <laughs> right, lads. Every one of you is just getting on the scales and I have a have a plan on how you're going to lose that weight. Everybody's going to be within a certain range. So he had this big plan, right? And he, he had a list. That wasn't of, bad. That, was that wasn't that was bad. He had a list of players and he goes, right, big man, keeper, where are you? And I went, I'm over here, Mick. He says, right, jump up on the scales. I said, me bollocks. <laughs> I fucking break the thing. <laughs> so he says, no, everybody's getting on the scales. I said, Mick, not a chance of getting on the scales. You either like me as the goalkeeper or I'll fuck off elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. And I remember I was the only player that didn't get up in the scales that night. Now, I have to say, bro. Was that out of embarrassment because you were at the point on a bit it of weight? It probably yeah. was, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was probably because, you know, as a goalkeeper, uh, you spend an awful lot of time doing goalkeeping training, a lot of practice that doesn't involve running. And a lot of goalkeepers, now nowadays the sports science and the fitness, but like a goalkeeper was just a fat fella that you picked to jump in the nets. I would have been a bit, at that stage, I'd, I'd played at the, the sort of senior Sunday level. I played a, a good range of football and I just wanted to turn up and enjoy me football. And, and, and my district officer allowed me to do that. But Mick came in with this kind of professional attitude and it kind of, it worked. It worked for a little while, but teams around us got 
got a little bit copped on to what was happening and patterns of play. And we just kept losing by the odd goal. It was stupid stuff, you know. And by the end of it, actually, we got relegated. I was kind of, uh, once you got relegated, we lost a few players. Yeah. Mick tried to change a few things. It just never really took off when I'm at Manor Town. So once Manor Town was over, uh, I got to I got to that stage where I was just tired. The legs started to give problems, like the, the yeah. hamstrings started to go. Uh, I couldn't commit to two nights training. And I have to say, some of the best training I ever did was under was under Mick. Yeah. And then they let Mick go, and a fella called Kieran Flaherty took over the team just to keep Manor Town floating because they always had a good sen- they always had a good senior setup. But the committee was more sort of invested in the schoolboy side of it. So we started the team ourselves, and I went in for a year and a half with Kieran Flaherty to just keep the, the team floating. And I went in as his assistant just to give him a dig out, but I kept getting injuries. You know, yeah, it was more time on the sideline than off it. And that's when I kind of got the idea that I'd go back into refereeing, you know. So what was your relationship with, like, with referees then when, you, when you're playing yourself? I was a bit of a thorn in their side, I'll be honest. Yeah. Uh, when I first went to me first uh, referee society meeting, so you know the way we have a society where it's, it's a bit like your union. They look after you, they make sure that things are done properly and any issues that goes through them. You have to be a member of it to walk in trios. They keep there's a, a book. lot in a brain, isn't there? For forty-five a, quid on a Sunday, there's a, or, there's a, there's a ton Jesus. of all this. You don't do it for the money. If you're if you're, if you're no, trying to ref for money, yeah. you might want to go into the, you know a bit of university and schools football. You can get a few matches, maybe Saturday in the DDSL. You might get four games. But look, I was never in. I was never in it for the money in that regard. But my first ever meeting, when they uh, any new members here, I'll stand up and everybody welcomes you and gives you a round of applause. And I'll never forget the front row of referees when they looked at me standing up to me and, oh, for f- <laughs> Now, not that I'd be criticising as a player. I was always passionate. I always, you know, because I kind of knew the laws from back with me Shelbourne days, I always kept up to date with the laws. And, like, we had an awful lot of older referees who they didn't have to upskill. I mean, some referees just paid their fee every year to the FEI and never did any modules or training. And it was kind of kept on that basis. So they wouldn't be getting in-law things right. And I'm very particular about things like that. Mm. When it comes to in-law, if that's the way it's laid down, that's the way it has to be, you know. Um, I'll never forget my first game in the Leinster Senior League. I was doing Bally Ulster against... Uh, oh, I, can't think of the, I can't think of the away team, but I went out again an hour beforehand. Some of the players hadn't even turned up. Like it was, a, again... You start off in the low divisions. Is that what happens? Yeah, obviously. Yeah, so they would we'll never way up. they would never throw you straight into the, the higher end of things. Now, at times that can be a bit tough because actually some of the hardest matches you ref are down in the division three A's, three B's at the time. But it was an incident that stuck with me to this day. Uh first match, uh one all, and I gave a free kick to the away team outside the box. And I walked up the field of play, waiting for the, the defender, centre half, had taken control of the ball. And he's looking up the field, and I'm heading into the centre circle, offset, to make sure I'm getting a view across the lines. And he didn't like the look of the setup in front of him, so he took the free kick by playing it back to the keeper. But the keeper had moved out to the left hand side of his box, and the ball went straight into the net. Of course, there's a big scream from the uh, home side, they've just scored. And I blew the whistle and pointed for the corner. And they're all looking at me. Everybody on that pitch was looking at me. And they're going, are you fucking mental? I said, no, it's a corner kick. It's a real, yeah. How can it be a yeah. corner kick? And I said, well, in law, free kicks, direct and indirect, cannot be scored directly into your own goal. If you score it, it's a corner, corner kick. kick. Yeah. So two management from Bally Hills that come onto the pitch and one he was an elderly enough man he said in all my years here and he was donkey's years at the club he says I've never seen such a fucking stupid decision just are you on your own down here on me own again like me, one of me, like me first game only a fresh out of the, the course and I said but look it's, it's, it's in law I said I have the laws of the game in my bag I said I'm not stopping the game because it was about maybe 15-20 minutes to go or whatever I said it's one all you have a corner. You either take it or I abandon the match because you're not going to give me, me uh, due respect. And then we'll let the league decide where it goes. So he says, well, I, I'll, I'll play with the corner. He says, but you're fucking wrong. And I, I, I can't wait to see that book. So anyway, they took the corner. Bit more play. Anyway, Ballyhoo start 
they got their, their second goal and ended up getting a toward. So they won 3 1. So I'm walking off the pitch, and in fairness, I was delighted because I'd had a, I, I had what I thought was a good game for me for some because it's an awful lot of technical stuff to do with reffing. And uh, as I'm walking off, your man said, he shook my hand, he says, Ah, you were lucky there that we won. I said, well, why was I lucky? I said, I got the decision correct in law. Yeah. I said, no, in all my years, I've never heard of it. I said, tell you what, I'm going to go to my dressing room. I'll give you the book. You can have a look at it. So I opened it up. I handed him the law. And I said, now have a read of that. And literally, you could see it, it dawned on him. Well, I never knew that. He hadn't a clue. Yeah. Now, there's loads of them little things in the law book. But that's set. Like, I think that was brought in. That was brought in back in the... I think it was early 80s or late 80s because of match fixing. So you know right. teams who wanted yeah. to miss kicking balls into the... That, that kind of, so I think that's why that was brought in, in 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 the laws of the game. But there's loads of those subtleties that change year in, year out. And really, really professional referees who put their time in, they know this. Yeah. So they always try and make them you make the best decision based on the laws, not what, what not what people want. That's that's the point, you know. Well, so thinking there, you're a goalkeeper and a referee. It's two lonely jobs in in, in football, like you know, more or less yeah. on your own, and it's a high pressure job as well. Because make a mistake for a goalkeeper, it's some ninety percent of the times it's a it's a yeah. goal, you know. Yeah. And then if a referee is, you, you expect to get all the decisions right. So yeah. So you must like the pressure. I do. I love a challenge. Mm. I do love a challenge. I, I was always. Not that I'm a loner, but I, I, I have a very close knit group of friends. I don't ten, I, I've loads of acquaintances, but I could count all my friends on one hand. I just don't, I don't operate that way. Uh, I know fellas who'd have, they'd say they have like fifty friends. That wouldn't be me. Yeah. Uh, I keep keep everybody fairly close that I like. I can spot snakes very easily. I think I'm a good judge of character. Um, I love. He's looking at you deeply there oh, no, yeah. for some reason. I absolutely, I love the game. I love being part of teams, but I did love that uh, you're the one aspect. I, I tell you what really used to give me great satisfaction when I was a goalkeeper was penalty shootouts. I loved yeah. them. I f- absolutely, when I was when I was younger, I had a. Uh, when we used to play in cup matches, I'd always wear a certain pair of underpants. And they were my penalty saving underpants. And I kept them special for cup games. Did you? Yeah. And more times than not, the penalty shootout, I'd make a save or two. And that's, I, I, I did like that loner part. So when you move that into refereeing, yeah. I don't, I, I'm not afraid to make a decision. Yeah. That's yeah. good. What's what's the social aspect of things with the ref, other referees and all? How are you using it? What's that group together? Or do you go nights together? Do you know what? Uh, out of I, the way I look at it, Leinster Senior League panel was somewhere around 70, 80 referees, right? Now, I think I'm not up to date on the figures. Uh, and he is aware, Brian, of who's who out of all them 70 oh referees. Yeah, so you're going to know every single one of them. I know every one of them at the moment, except for maybe two or three new entrants. But what I do is I still go and watch matches to see what the standards are and see these new fellas coming on. Listen, we've had a few people come into the league and we have a few referees in the league and I don't like them. Um, it's going to be that way. I mean, these are all part of football. I'm sure there's fellas in your club you don't particularly like. The people in my house I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you have to be able to spot them. You know, I can, I can, I can spot the snakes. I can, I can spot the ones who are false. Um, I tend not to get involved with them an awful lot. I work with them. And I'd have no bother working with them, but I expect a standard from them. Now, I mean, uh, <laughs> I remember myself and Eamon Connolly, uh, you know, Eamon, the refs in the Leinster Senior yeah. League. His, Eamon's his, very good. His, his brother, brother Tomas, would have been League of Ireland and that. He's now an assessor in, in the FAI. But I think Eamon's probably the most naturally gifted referee. I think he's brilliant. Yeah, he's, he's, he's an brilliant. incredible decision maker and he's so calm, so cool. Uh, look, I can grade all referees pretty much like that, whether they're, they're good, cool, calm, under control. Um, we went out and there was a new entrant fella came in maybe five or six years ago and I'll never forget that morning I won't name him but uh, I'd never met him before and his opening gambit when I met him at the pitch was I'm such and such you're in for a treat today how? Oh, you're going to see a complete referee in the, uh, display here and I was like who is this fucking Johnny here? Yeah. Anyway, the first fifteen minutes told me all I needed to know. He was only a new young ref. Or no, he'd come over from a different league. league. I'm not too sure. He might have been two or three years refing at that stage. But his first five decisions said everything to me. 
Like he let stuff go that you know, you know those first few minutes in the game, especially a certain type of game. Like I can always think back, I love doing Crumlin Bluebell. Yeah. I love doing them yeah. games. Because you knew it was going to be a bash from the start. Feisty, straight away. And yeah. you set the tone in them first few minutes. My game plan going out to those games is always right, lads, we're gonna keep it tight. We're not taking any abuse here and do not let any shit or shenanigans go on. Because again, I want the two teams like Crumlin or Bluebell to play good football, hard football. Keep love, everyone on the pitch. Love and tackle. And try and keep everybody there. Look, my, my fastest card in a Crumlin Bluebell game was 15 seconds. Crazy. And, but it set, the, it set the tone. Yeah. Not one flew into a tackle after it. It was all control, all good, good football, which I loved. And it set out the ability for them to go out and concentrate on football. Because sometimes local rivalries... I mean, how many players do you know that swap between Crumlin and yeah. Bluebell or, you know, move between them and Luke? And there's loads of them. But I'll never forget that morning. Your man was going to, he said, you're going to, you're in for a tree. Oh, did we get a fucking tree? Half time, he said it to me. Well, what do you think? I said, shocking. Yeah. And again, I've always gone with the adage of, ask me what. You ask me and I'll give you an honest answer. Uh, Deco Troy is very like that. And a lot of referees would look to him for that bit of advice because if you ask him a question, He's not going to sugarcoat. He's going to give you what you need to hear. And I'm pretty much the same. Uh, I might not be as blunt as him because Deco, just straight down the middle, I might dress it up a little bit. But that morning, I gave him everything. Now, he went down the second half and tidied it up a bit. But at that stage, the control was gone, you know. His decision making. People's opinion were made up already about him. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes before you walk onto the pitch, it's made. But it's up to you to set your, your stamp on the game and, and control it because it is all about control. I think the difference between you and him is you, you were saying earlier on that you told them I'm here to enforce 17 rules I don't care who wins yeah. and who loses and he, but he simply t- he want, wanted that game about himself. I think he went, so he I think, I think he went out to try and impress me and Eamon because we're, we were senior enough referees at the time. Like We have some wonderful referees in that league. You know, very experienced guys. You know, like Davy Fitzsimons. If he, Another if, legend. If he bitch you, you die of cuteness. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Because that's how he's tuned in. He can read a game. Like, I learned so much from him. Uh, I wrote down a few other lads here as well. Uh, like, Tony Carney would have been, uh, he refed one of the cup finals I played uh, in, in Daly Mount for Cherryfield, one of the lower end of the cups. But again, he was really good at controlling the game. He'd set the pace nearly, and he took no shy. And then when he became the assessor, he just nailed people because he didn't like this idea of fellas thinking they were great refs he wanted you to be a good ref yeah and that i think that's that's fair you, you send someone out to do a job you know if you want the windows fit to your gaff tomorrow you'd want a fella who can do the job and do it right so i think that's the, the i think the, when the ref has a good game is that you, you f- nearly forget that they're there you can do it. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. I think that's his, that's we know he has a good game because he's not making it about himself, slowing the game down, stopping yeah, the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I never slow the game down, bar to try and get a bit of a grip of the aggression in, involved. Yeah. And one one shout that I hate from, uh, I absolutely hate these shouts from players where, oh, it's all about you. Yeah. Like, I don't know what that means. Yeah. Because if he's talking about the management and control and implementation of 7 and laws, yeah, it is all about me because I'm the ref. Yeah. And again, I go back to Shay Travers. Uh, he was doing a match one time and I think Pat Devlin had uh, come from Bray Wanderers to help manage in Fairhouse Clover to help one of the lads. I can't think of the guy he was helping. But Pat was giving him shit for 20 minutes. Typical League of Ireland kind of a, a, a stance on it. I remember Shay going over. He hands Pat his whistle takes off his jersey and hands him jersey and goes, you fucking ref. Yeah. And back on him, went, oh, uh, no, Shay, you're all right. You yeah. get back out there. So it's all op- it's all opinion, but I think the, the main opinion has to be we're there to do a game. 95 to 98% of referees that I know in the Leicester Senior League turn up to get a game of ball played fair and square. No badness, you know? Yeah. Um, so when we were playing, they were always saying about the AOL and Leicester Senior are kind of two different leagues, which was the yeah. best... Ref was would what was your connection be with the AUL referees? Would just so the only re- AUL referees that I would know are lads that would have come over from the AUL, and we've had some good ones come over from the AUL over the years. Uh, I've never refed in the AUL, but I've played in it. And when I played in it, AUL was a very very top division. It seems to have dropped back for some reason over the years. You know, like we had like Markovic, as I said earlier, like we were we were a fantastic outfit. 
Uh, it was a good standard of football. I thought the referees actually at that time in the AOL were very, very good. Some good ones there, Lock Lock and Whiting in Bradley and all. Good yeah, lads yeah, yeah, no, there's some good lads, lads have come and then there's lads have come over to us to the Leinster Senior League and done really well in the Leinster Senior League. Um, I've watched them progress and I love seeing lads get progressed on. Um, I've refed everything that can be refed in the Leinster Senior League except for the Intermediate Cup. That was the one that eluded me. You've done all the other finals? All the other big ones, including the Wally win. I've always uh, got stuck into that one because I won it as a player. I refed it. Very good, yeah. And I, I lined it as well. So I've won every medal you can. I think I might have even got runners up in it. But again, you're, you're looked after in the Leicester Senior League for your ability, number one. And the only thing that I didn't get was the Intermediate Cup final. There's a couple of things got in the way of that. How, how does that... How does that come about, like being ranked to get it? Yeah, so it comes down to your assessor, your lead assessor, and the assessors in the league. And like it was only played yesterday, the final, and it was Cork officials, I believe, were on it. It was a Dublin team and a Cork team. Generally, the home team, it's refs from their league. That's generally the way it happens. But last year, there was two teams in it, and one of our lads, uh, John, got the refereeing of it. Um, I thought I was in the picture for a couple of years. Um, but I just it was just one that eluded me. I lined in the final in the uh, Tatnitala Stadium with Johnny Glynn in the middle. Do you remember Johnny Glynn? Who was the who played? It was the smaller lad. It was Cherry Orchard against. Uh, oh, what's the? There's another Cork team down there. It could have been Rockmount. But yeah, I, I lined in it, and I always thought, you know, if I got that, I'd be if happy. You lined in and, a... and you know, I, I was kind of hanging on a little bit, thinking that I might get a look at it, but I don't think. I think it had eluded me. Um, certain things happened in my life that kind of killed it. Um, I lost it. I lost a bit of momentum. Just fell off the the curve a little bit. Not so much from the standard of me refereeing, but you have to you have to get into everything. You have to be involved wholeheartedly with the with the ISRS. Yeah. And then I was always that little bit. I was always a little bit outspoken about certain things, and that might have helped me as well. You know, I know fellas that would sell their granny. To get the intermediate cup final, you know, they'd make phone calls. Really, yeah. Oh, yeah. They'd ring people saying, "Look, there's any talk about who's getting the F- the intermediate? I, I, I think I'd like to have a, a bang at that." And like, no disrespect to some of the refs on that thing, but I don't think they could cope with the the final of the that magnitude. Grandeur. Yeah, like I watched, I watched three of my colleagues ref it in the Aviva, and I always visioned or saw myself standing out in that centre circle. At some stage, but it just it just eluded me and it got away from me. And do you know what? I suppose my opinion would be that I could have done it. I definitely would have had the ability to do it, but for some reason didn't get it. It's the one regret that I really have with uh, refereeing is that I didn't do it. With any aspirations to go to the League of Ireland, push towards there? Would yeah. I? So uh, I I was asked back in 2011 to go on to the School of Excellence. Yeah. And I started the process to go on to the School of Excellence. But uh, in December 2011, and the School of Excellence would have been starting in the January, uh, my missus got pregnant. And that kind of put a... The damper on things. Yeah, that because... Damper, don't well, not that a way, damper, yeah. because what happened was we'd been... For years, we'd been trying to have a kid, and yeah. it just wasn't happening. And then, like, we were together for donkey's years, and, like, it was 2011, and Christmas Eve, she told me... Ah, uh, brilliant. We were a duo baby. So that... That kind of made me think about it. Now, she was all for it. She said, yeah, look, if you want to do this, go for it. But when I thought about it, I work shift in the fire service. So you could be up on, you know, Donegal of a Friday night, Derry, all these trips around. And look, I was already given a good amount of my time to the Leinster Senior League, but at least with the Leinster Senior League, you're kept within usually Dublin Herodious, all yeah. the time. But then you have two or three trips to Arklo or Athlone or whatever. It's a little bit more manageable, so I had to decline and step away from that process. Um, I don't think it, I don't think it was that bad. I, I think I'd made the right decision in that regard. Um, things got a bit complicated after that later on, and that would have taken away from it. So I don't think I'd have had as much passion because the lads who go to that elite level referee, there's an awful lot of time and, and energy and effort. I see some of the lads now in the Leinster Senior League who are on that progression path, and it's tough. It is tough. Would say it's a young man's game, would it be? We're just yeah, yeah. So what was that? That was twenty eleven. That's thirteen years ago. So I would have been thirty seven ish. So I think at that time, good age, I was yeah. probably 
ideal time ready yeah fitness wise attitude wise absolutely but when and I'm sure anybody who has kids knows is when you your first kid comes along you like to be there for the support and, and making it happen you know yeah don't you? Uh, so yeah I, no, no regrets on that. That my only regret intermediate cup final. Mm. Uh, if I go back, if anybody's listening, I, I'd be willing to take it if you. Oh, yeah, well, there, there, there's your phone call <laughs> in there now, yeah. No, that's one thing I'd never do. Is I never yeah. rang asking for fixtures. Mm. Maybe that's why you kind of alluded you to the people that are getting there. Bar do you know what? You can, you can look at it in a cynical way that there's a political aspect to it, where you know be signed up to this guy, this chairman of that. No. It, I was always one who wanted to get things on my own merit. I never begged or borrowed or asked for anything. Yeah. I always liked to do it on my own hard work. And look, it eluded me. I had a few issues along the way. And there are things in life that are way more important than uh, an intermediate cup final or even any cup final. So your, your life takes precedence, you know. Yeah. Mm, definitely, yeah, definitely. Does any games kind of stick out to you that would would have gave you a little relish where you'd be like oh, I enjoyed that one or over all the years or yeah, things yeah. like that yeah I did, I did a couple as I say Crumlin Bluebell uh, derbies loved them loved them uh, and didn't get one in the last couple of years uh, I don't know why again I don't think it was down to ability and all that but one game that we did um, was Colester or no Kilbarrick against Sheriff in the quarter final of the FEI Junior and you know the way uh, they put the fence around that and it's an Astro now the yeah. the Kilbarrick yeah. pitch. pitch that had Greendale is it? Still? yeah Greendale that hadn't been done at the time and it was ropes and all the rest of it and it just it was it just felt like everybody from the local area and Sheriff was there it was like going into it was like going into a San Siro <laughs> moment yeah 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 and I was on the I was on the line. Deco Troy was in the middle, and I think Owen Murphy was on the far line, and that was a tough match. But we absolutely was that that match. I think I might have been at that yeah. game myself. We yeah, absolutely so. nailed it. I seen a, a fella. I seen a fella off uh, Sheriff give a, an elbow straight to the jaw, and I fluttered to Deco to get, get was him that, yeah. get him yeah. get him out. And again, like you're doing that with the baying crowd behind you and, and the very close was only it wasn't rubbed up that much and a, yeah. and a little rope around like if they want so a bit intimidating it. for you as such yeah do you know what or is that a, I, I a suppose a... looked intimidating I'm not easily intimidated I, uh, I always had that fearless feel about me you know I always went out without any fear um, a little bit nervous you know going out and making Good sure nerves. we got the right decision yeah. but the one thing I can say on that night is we got everything bang on I think it was one of the best games I was ever involved in and the likes of violent conduct, there's no place for it. I know we all can lose it a bit, or you feel a little bit snappy at someone. And as many a time, I wanted to throw a dig at a fella. Yeah, but it's, there's but, no uh, room for it. There's no room for it in that aspect. Because again, think about that. Like we sent a fella off. I'm not too sure. It was a first half, and um, we sent a fella off and made that a tougher game for. They end up winning, side. Sheriff, didn't they? Yeah, with down to ten men. Yeah, yeah. but again, it was a, it was a fantastic. It was thing sent to be off. Involved. Was it John Rock? Uh, I thought John Rock straight away. Yeah. was John, was it? I think it might have been, yeah. yeah I can't John. really remember. Again, I think it was, yeah. the likes of uh, some referees would know every... Sounds like something they did. know every single stat. <laughs> I, ha- I, I kept a book when I was refing. I wrote every result. I wrote every card that I did. Because when you're doing your reports and then you might be yeah, you have asked to, come to look back, back on them. Of course, yeah. If I had my book with me, I could pull that fixture now. But that was one of the best things. And to do it with... One of your, your best mates, you know. Me and Deco have been buddies since we, we went down to the Michael Ward Trophy back in probably 09, 2010, somewhere around then. So he is one of my bestest buddies, you know. Big um, big games like that, have you ever been like influenced by the Lion, say, on a decision? You know, something that you're a bit like 50-50 with and the shouts from behind you, the pressure's on, are you blowing the whistle or putting the flag up or... so. I'm as sure every referee no, has is as, in this as position. As I said to you, there are things that can influence a referee. Um, I always like, and I'd, I'd stay honest on it, I'd always like to think that I gave my honest opinion at that moment in time. I don't think I ever let the crowd sway me in any way, shape or form. What I do remember from my career was just that, that one match near the end of it, the four weeks out where I did, mm. I just made a decision that was wrong in regards to my character, my own moral judgment, and then being a referee. But no, I think even in really stressful, like Cherry Orchard probably, there's members that would have been there in that intermediate cup final. 
I uh, they they scored the 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 Wayside Cork team. I can't remember exactly who it was. They scored in extra time to to win it. It was nearly. It was. I think it was the hundred nineteenth minute. And there was talk of it being offside, and I was now berated by it. Again, I can see a whole season. So, again, in those moments, you take this ear and switch it off because some of the stuff that was said could be where you go in and start throwing red cards. But I was I was on the line in that Intermediate Cup final, and in my mind, I was 100% on the spot where I should have been. And when the ball got there, yes, he was offside, but when it was played, he wasn't. And for weeks... I was hearing from Cherry Archer players and Cherry Archer, oh, you fucked that one up on his mind, you know. <laughs> and again, some of them are really good about it. One or two were a little bit vex, vexed over it. But uh, the referee that day, Johnny Glenn, as part of our little, when the referee gets the Intermediate Cup finally by his presence for the, the assistants and the forts, he uh, he gave me a DVD of the match that was produced up in the stand in Tala. And I put it onto the computer and I was able to stop it when the ball was played and your man was on by a good yard. But when the ball got to him, he was off. And, to me, that was I yeah. got that one right. Yeah. But again, these are these are moments in time. You get one look, that's it. That's all you get. You know. Mm. Um. Many many games a season would you do as a referee? Like? You're trying to work out how much we're earning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the tax man, <laughs> yeah, the tax man no, we can't go near because most of it is uh, for your travel and your time. Is it? Um, so <laughs> no, just just put it. Yeah. Because you were saying that you're getting burned out like, yeah. near the end, and it's kind of kind of over on the but. If you're doing about three a week, and you're doing two to three a week, that's and what's a season running over it's nearly six months. So that, that's a lot of games, and now you will get bored now because obviously a season for for any player, so you probably get about twenty two games or something in some leagues. Yeah, and then you get a cup, a cup run. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could hit a minimum of thirty games, but for yourself, you're probably double, triple in that easily. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You could be you could be looking somewhere around sixty to seventy games, and again, some referees would do college games during the week. The way I always looked at it was, I was only valuable as a referee if I did two matches. Yeah. If you went to that third match, it just took too much away. You physically couldn't do it because, like, a centre half would run certain amounts in a match. You know the way they're all tracked now in the Premiership, and they can tell you how many miles the or kilometers yeah. the midfielder. Most referees now use a GPS watch. Right. And, uh, like some matches, I'd have, I'd have been up touching ten k. What do you yeah. Immediate match, like you'd be on that ten k for ninety minutes. Yeah, some play, some players wouldn't be doing that. Yeah. No, and again, the centre half wouldn't necessarily no, unless yeah. he was going on runs. Midfielders, yeah, they'd be hitting up around yeah, that. Yeah, full backs maybe. But eight to ten k yeah. in a proper. Now that's if you're putting it in. But that's and to take ten uh, k, and you had to keep your mind sharp as well because yeah. you know yourself. Yeah. Once you get tired, the mind kind of switches off, yeah. especially as a player. But yeah, you, if you're doing that, that's that's the fitness has to be a whole yeah, very well, high. Look, we get we get fitness tests every year and. To be at that grade one, which I was at for an awful lot of my refereeing career, you do have to have a certain level of fitness. Now, it's very different to football, playing fitness, because refereeing it's, it's, is all short, short yeah. runs, long, short runs, and then back again. So your movement is constant. I, I loved the fact that uh, like refereeing, if, if it got a bit too much, <clears throat> and I've seen that with other referees where they're tired, they blow the whistle, and they go over and have a chat with someone. Yeah, and they're doing that to get that breath back, to pull it back, you know. And, it, and sometimes the fitness can, can make yourself tired. tired. Yeah. And as you get tired, your decision making capacity drops. It happens yeah. in every in every yeah, game. Yeah, it, every athlete it happens in every every uh, business as well, where you're you're working like you know screen tired, tired, tired yeah. drivers yeah. or dangerous yeah. drivers. So what I always tried to do was I always tried to maintain a certain level of fitness and a certain amount of sharpness. And one thing that I always loved about refereeing was that players only think you're making decisions when you're blowing the whistle. But you're making decisions nearly every couple of seconds in a game of football. Some of your best decisions are when you don't blow the whistle because you might see an advantage or you might allow a certain type of tackle because you know that the passage of play is going. Remember Mike Dean had the famous clip when we get sports, you know your sports or something, I can't remember. But he plays advantage. And he runs away celebrating. They scored it. Run away. He's running away celebrating himself because oh, yeah. he got got that decision right. You know. Let me tell you the amount of times I've done that where I've given an advantage and it ends up in the back of the net. Yeah. What really sells that is when there's an assessor there. The assessor tells you afterwards <clears throat> that was a great decision. Yeah. You, the way you played that advantage. Now, right? the back, yeah. There are times where they pull you and say you played an advantage there. It didn't work. It's probably the the only time really you get a pat on the back if you have a good game. Majority of the, when the players are coming over shaking your hand, managers, majority of them probably 
80, 90% of them wouldn't say you had a great game, do they? But it's always one thing that's at the losing there, obviously. No, yeah, but you could have had a good game either way, like, you know. If a team's at the losing there, the first thing they're going to say to the referee is, well done, ref, you had a great game. Yeah. Near the end of me me time as a ref, I was... uh, I got to the point where they'd walk up and if they didn't say anything but thank you, I'd just say, it's all right to say thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank yeah. You. No, it's all right to say thank you. And then there was one manager, he only shook your hand when he won. Right. And it's something again that I, I used to do and, and I know Deco Troy more or less invented this, but uh, if he doesn't shake your hand when he loses, when he comes up on a win, you don't shake his hand. You say to him, you don't shake it when you lose, you're not shaking it when you win. Yeah. And it does make them think on. You know, uh, I, I I remember I did a I did a Metropolitan Cup match and the team that lost they were so upset after and it was nothing to do with the refereeing uh, unit that was out that night and again I was in the middle, but if it's it's they look for anything to have an argument with you. I did nothing wrong in the game, got every in law got every decision right, and the other way people say I was very harsh. Yeah, but in law it's correct. Yeah, yeah. He came up to shake my hand and I put the hand out and I'm after been shaking forty or fifty people and they're all crowding around you. So it's not the air like if I met you out in the street or I met you in the pub, I'd shake your hand, I'd hold it for a little bit and I'd have a good old chin wipe, but you don't have that time. But as he walked up he shook me shook my hand the same as everybody before and I just gave it a quick shake and when when I let go of his hand he goes if you're gonna shake me hand, shake it properly. <laughs> it was just, it was anything to have a pop at the ref, yeah, you know. Yeah, and I just yeah, looked yeah. at him and I says, yeah, "It's okay, he, just to say thank you." He's in the dressing room saying, "They should see what's said to the ref there." Yeah, 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 yeah. Big one, yeah. The little points gone. I think the respect in some regards has gone. Do you think? So see where you kind of hand yourself with um, a bit of sarcasm, or, or not? Won't be sarcasm, just to come across because you, you have to stand your own point as well. You have to yeah. be, come across as tough. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think some people uh, can mis- misunderstand that as arrogance uh, and and to be kind of saying, "Geez, this rapper's up his own bollocks now." Yeah. Like, the way you come, no, no way Deco talks to people. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. The people they are la- relatable to him, but some people could take that as arrogance. And then, yeah, they can, and, and they also and, and they're not their, their tails up already. You know, you can say something, and people can take it ten different ways. Yeah, exactly. And it depends on how they want to take it. You know, like the famous Dublin thing. Ah, how are you, old cunt? Yeah, <laughs> like it's, it's, if you said that in London. They take that really offensive, whereas that could be our best pal. Yeah. You could have a hug and go to a point together. So you have to choose your language very careful. And I was always one who very rarely used language towards players. Sometimes you had to, because if they're using it, sometimes just a quick word to shut them back down, or they could have a six, seven foul language tirades at you and you say would you ever fuck off their reactions can't say that yeah well actually that way, yeah. you know yeah, well, we're yeah. going back over this here lad you yeah, know yeah, yeah. You, you were just speaking to me like that yeah, so yeah. actually we we'll agree with that yeah I tell you what I started to do as well now this was uh, I, I, I got to a point in my career at one stage where I was starting to get a few games in the lower divisions on a Saturday because they don't like to keep you at the high level. They drop you back and forth. And Tony Carney was the uh, the allocator at the time and he always gave you good games. But he'd, he'd, he'd ring you and say, look, I'm sending you to such and such. This is a Division 3 Z. It's going to be it's gonna be a tough one. But will you muck it out for me? Yeah, no bother. But remember one time I read Pierre Luigi Colina's book, right? And he was mad about psychology. And he, he if you ever seen him referee, like he, he could be really aggressive. He could put his hands on players. Yeah, yeah. But he had the persona to do it. There's a few psychological tricks he gave in the book. And I'm willing to try anything now. And one Saturday morning, I was down on a local field near my house. And uh, the away team was, uh, let's just say they were they were very posh, right? So, first tackle in the game, nothing in it. I played the advantage and the assistant manager goes, Referee! <laughs> how dare you? Right, so now I knew I was, I was heading into the posh thing here. That's an absolute disgrace. How did you give that? You know, so this this poshness was coming out. So I decided to try a little Pierre Luigi type trick, you know. So I, I'd kind of thought of a few little scenarios that I did, but this was going on 20 minutes into the game. So normally when I go up to a, play, a manager to have a, a stern chat with him, I'll pull him a little bit separate from the technical area and I'll try and be nice and quiet, just me and him, unless I want a, a public warning where I'm letting him know I'm not taking any more shite. But this guy was just so posh and so nice, right? I said, I'll, I'll mess with his brain. So I ran about 20 yards, 30 yards away from the technical area, and I pointed at him. I said, excuse me, manager, can you come here, please? What? What? And he's walking down to me, right? And his assistant went to come with me, and I said, you can stay in the technical area. I'll deal with him. So I pulled him in real close, and I said to him, come here. 
did you ever buy your underwear in Marks and Spencer's? <laughs> <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, what? <laughs> I said, I've asked you a question. I want a straight yes or no answer. Have you ever bought your underwear in Marks and Spencer's? <laughs> what are you on about, referee? I said, I'm going to ask you one more fucking time. Have you ever bought your underwear in Marks and Spencer's? And he goes, no, I haven't. I said, you should. They're fabulous. <laughs> right? And I ran back out into the centre circle. And now you can picture this. I'm in, the in the <laughs> I'm in the centre circle, right? And I'm, right, keeper, let's go. Start off. So, yeah. blew the whistle. Restart the play. Let's go. And you can see him, and he's standing there. What just fucking happened? <laughs> yeah. So I see him walk back down, and as the play is progressing, he gets back, and you can see the other posh fella going, what happened? <laughs> and he's obviously said to him, yeah, he no. asked me, have I ever bought Marks and Spencer's underwear? And between the two of them, they're going, <laughs> what is he fucking on about? But you know what happened? They didn't know. They were so confused. You went about chocks out with Marks and Spencer's. They didn't, they didn't have anything else to say, to say for the half. That, yeah. Yeah. And it was only after the game he came up to me, and he says, Ref, I just don't understand the question. I said, you weren't meant to. It was meant to confuse you. Now, I always tried to bring something like that in that to, certain, was, yeah. to certain types of things. Now, could you do that with Martin Lochran in Crumlin during a Crumlin Blue Bell? Not even slightly. Yeah. You have well, you knew your surroundings. Oh, I, knew, and I think it was the character that I was dealing with. I knew he was coming down going, I will have a right good go with this fellow. Yeah. But I knew if I just sent him off on a curveball, he'd be so confused. Because the anticipation of what the referee is going to do, and then he does something completely off the charts. Yeah, it's brilliant. It just, it controlled the mind. And again, you can afford to do that at times in the lower leagues. Now, go up to Senior Sunday, I was always straight as a die. Yeah. Especially big games like that, you were guaranteed an assessor. Yeah. And when the assessor's there, you can't be saying that. But imagine that in the, in the when report. You kind of, <laughs> do you know the problem is with, with, when them? there's an assessor there, right? He's not only assessing you, he's assessing your team, right? So we go out as a team of three. So there's three teams on the pitches, two 11s and one three aside, right? And I always, as the more senior referees I went on in the years, sort of into the 14th, 15th year, they'd give you young fellas to break in, look after. So you wouldn't want to teach them bad habits that they carry on. And then there's certain things that I would do in a game, like if a centre half, after clearing the ball and he's got it to his mate, gets a little bump, but he wants to continue, wants to continue. If he just kept going and annoyed me, I'd just give an indirect free kick against him and tell him, that's from out. Yeah, yeah. So little control things, but in law, you're meant to give a free kick against him and a yellow card. Yeah, okay. But I would withhold the yellow card because I, t- I thought that was a good enough tool and it's a great tool to use. Now, when assessor's there, he's going to drop your points. And that's something when the so assessor... So if, if an assessor's there, Brian, on the sideline, yeah. are you giving that yellow card? In law, yes. But, no, on, but, on, you, but on, on occasion, on a, I didn't because right. I was... With an assessor there. I'd be willing to stand up in front of him and say, well, I was using that as a controlling yeah. uh, tool. And will that work for you on your end? It will work on my end because he will drop me a point or possibly drop you down. But he doesn't want you transferring that across to the young So in fairness, as I got longer into it, I got cleverer with yeah. when assessors and who the assessor it's experience, was. Experience, isn't it? It is experience, and one thing that I would change instantly. And I know I spoke to Victor Lockman. You know, uh, the referee's assessor. He was our head assessor. He he was one of my favourite assessors because he come in and he just give you the the hair dryer, and by the end of it, you were now clearer to a degree. But you loved the fact that he came out and gave you everything. You yeah. know, he's very passionate for it. But I, I always chat to him about this. Uh, if you now under the FEI rules, if you're going out to assess, say, yourself tomorrow, ref in a game, I'm the assessor. I have to ring you and give you 24 hours notice that I'm right. coming. Now, I suppose the FEI are looking in fairness to give you the opportunity to be right for the game. But I think, and this is my opinion only, if you're given notice of the assessor, you're going to be top of the pops you're gonna show them every run you're gonna be doing everything by the seven day in laws and you know perfection and it's not a true reflection of the referee that's gonna be on the park week in week out because I still go to uh, Leinster senior matches and I just stand and watch like any other spectator although I'm thinking of starting to abuse dugouts to see how they like it <laughs> but what I do is I watch the referees and when there's no assessor there like some of them could be walking in the centre circle and refing it from the centre yeah, circle yeah. which is not fair to the teams as well 
But I understand that they might have had a match the Friday night. This is a Saturday. They're taking it a bit handy because yeah. they might have a big one on the Sunday. So I always said to the assessors, shouldn't just turn up and don't even like wear a cap. Yeah. Don't be noticed. You should that be waving like there's an assessor there. You all should the time. be on your game. I was always on my game. I always turned up to give the best performance for the 46 quid out of 50 quid that I was getting. And that's the way I kind of set my standard, you know. What would I uh, kind of drink before games and stuff? How, how would you? Handle that. How, so, how soon before the game now? A couple of hours there. A couple yeah. of hours. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I mean the play, I don't know the players have said, said, oh, stay in the night before because my performance will be affected if I go out and have a few drinks. Yeah. Referees, listen, everyone's you know, he's are human. Like, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He's had to have social lives as well there, but would you would you stop not drink the night before or how would you go? So the hard one for, and I can, again, speak for the, the whole panel here, the hard one is when you have the big games on the Sunday because everybody Saturday night is there, disco night or their, their night out with their missus. Yeah. Uh, I was lucky in a way that I worked shift work. So my Saturday night could be a Monday night because I'd be off Monday yeah. and Tuesday or it could be a Wednesday night. Right. So I tended not to, for a lot of my career, I tended not to go out. And I, like, I do love a drink. Yeah. But I tended not to go out and get sozzled. I don't tend to get very, very drunk. And I just love a pint of Guinness. So I... I the night of a big match, say say it was on Crumlin Blue about eleven o'clock arm hour off, yeah. I might have a I might have a point the night before, maybe two, but that'd be the max on yeah. those type of games. The problem with Sunday morning football is no matter how well you prepare, you have to be on your game that eleven o'clock in the morning. Um Friday night game, if I'd done a good one, I'd get home some nights about half ten, I'd go over to the local for a few because oh, yeah. I know Saturday afternoon at two o'clock I have to be back on the pitch. I don't know. I don't know many many referees who absolutely can the the drink. I think most of them turn up of a of a Sunday morning. I've really, really seen him myself. No, I don't think I've ever yeah. seen or but smelled but, it. <laughs> well, again, because it, matter, yeah. as I was saying, the dedication. People just think the referees just turn up, right? There's yeah. you're just saying that you still four modules a year. Yeah. You still a training camp. You do yeah. fitness test. Yeah. You stay off to drink the weekend. Yeah. You're doing uh, probably seventy games a season. Yeah. Three three games a week. Yeah. Um. You're still getting abused and getting finger pointed at you on match yeah, day. So yeah, and there's it's a the line. I know. I understand exactly that. But isn't it the line you're in? And I and I get where it, it all comes from. And I'm. I don't condone it, the abuse. I don't. Like, I don't think I've ever abused the ref. I've been a little Jack Russell on the pitch yeah, yeah, yeah. and a moany little fucker, as you probably know. <laughs> Glad you're saying you that. No, but well, look, let's call a spade a spade. But I, I, I've never abused the referee. In certain ways, but when what I've you're saying the there, I've yeah, seen so I've seen, yeah. I've seen it from more, more kind of like spectators. I've usually see it for, yeah, and probably the dugout a little bit more so. But what you're saying there is definitely, is definitely right. But isn't it? it it's basically what it says on the the thing. It, it kind of comes with the job, doesn't it? Unfortunately, yeah, but I think it's progressing more. It's it's happening a lot more. Yeah, and it's ha- happening. It's, I think it's getting worse as you said social media something now there's no escape man like, where, years ago you'd be like yeah, you're yeah, a wanker yeah. and then it'd be gone you're gone yeah. he's gone he's gone that way but so, people are putting things up on social media and it's just getting prolonged and yeah so uh, I, I, I was always one of those ones that like I expected a certain level of passion from mm-hmm. players and management but when it gets to the level of abuse I think it's it's wholly wrong the same as if it was happening with the players and I know I've been in dressing rooms where players would abuse other players you know you come in after doing your best and the fella you, you're nobody useless whatever I can understand passion but when it gets to actual abuse and I, I've seen it on, on a couple of things on Facebook and over the years of people I know that are involved in the league and mental health issues you know young men they're very prone to it I've seen it in my 24 year career in, in the fire service I've been at hangings I've been at suicides where it's young men who feel they're at the end of their tether yeah. and have nowhere else to go. And I've actually I've actually helped people that I've reft through my paramedic work. And so the the tough bit is they're humans. We're all humans. But that disconnect happens with referees. I've seen a fella put up a beautiful post about, you know, if you see someone struggling in your dressing room, help them out. Don't be afraid to have the chat. If you see someone who's withdrawing or showing the signs of suicidality, be careful. be careful with your words, be careful what you say. And he was throwing this out on Facebook and it got a great response and I think it was a wonderfully beautiful thing to write up. But this same person would throw abuse at a referee and not think that yeah. that's a human. And so when you have 
the disconnect and i think that's one of the big things here where there's a huge disconnect we see it in society you see people of uh certain groups or certain places in dublin where the guards are just a hated figure right now we all know why because they're the law and people do iffy things but even in my fire service like for years we were getting bottled out of going to bonfires but we weren't there to stop anybody's fun. We were there to keep places safe. safe. And I remember one night going into a, a bonfire around around Halloween time. We were going into an estate to a cardiac arrest. We weren't there for the, the bonfire. We were there to try and save someone's life. <clears throat> and we were being bottled over as we were coming up to the house. And one of the young fellas throwing the bottles. It was his dad that was having the cardiac arrest. Jesus. And we still ran in. But again, <clears throat> it's the uniform. It's the position of power they see it as. So it's a power struggle. And I've always tried to be on the level with fellas because I came from a working class background. I was part of a family in the 80s that was both parents unemployed. My man and dad hadn't got a bane. You know, uh, I grew up in what would be not so much a hugely rough, rough area, but I grew up in the middle of Tala where we, we lived and ha- football was your outlet. But I think when it starts becoming abuse, and I know when you talk about it's expected, but it's hard to like give you another example. People just jump in on it, right? So I didn't. No, I don't. I don't mean that it's expected. Like the the abuse that can be given think? or taken. I yeah. don't mean. I didn't mean yeah, that. Sure. that, that I, think, I think what you meant was if you're going to be a referee, you know you're going to get abuse. Exactly. Like that's what yeah, I say. Yeah, that's yeah. expectable. Yeah. It just it comes with the job because you're making decisions that people obviously got, someone's going to win, someone's going to lose, in, in yeah. something like that. So you're going to get. But, Backlash but here, you know? here's another one just very on, on another type of a sport uh, me and the missus went to see one of her nephews he plays rugby right and I'd never been to a live rugby game not a rugby player supporter don't really like the sport I'll, geez, I'll join a bandwagon when the Six Nations is on for a few and points a few with the minutes, lads yeah. <laughs> but we went to the rugby game right and the referee there was a, 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 a tackle made and the referee blew his whistle and guess what happened everybody stopped looked at him and accepted his decision I was dumbfounded. Right? Mm. I was looking at this going, hold on, everybody's lit. And y- yes, sir, no problem. He then continued on the game. Uh, some really rough tackles in it. And again, he had a word with a few people. And when he called people over, they looked at him and listened yeah. to him. I spent a lot of time, sorry, number 10, can you stand up and stop yeah, fixing your socks? I'm looking at me. Have a bit of respect. Let's go man on man here. And so I was looking at this referee getting respect and I was thinking, so the rugby people don't go in with that idea that it's expected for the abuse yeah. and after the match they lined up as he walked off and gave him a round of applause and a shake of the hand as he went across and I was thinking I know rugby's very different sport wise but attitude wise it seems to have the respect element and actually if you give respect to referees you asked earlier does do referees change their decisions based on how they're being treated or and I just told you yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the fella who got clattered Actually, if you bring a referee on board with you, it's a natural human instinct. If there's a 50 50, it's going to give it to the side that have been nice to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm not saying he'll deliberately do it, but we're human. You know, most referees have a little bit of it. They want to be told they're great. Now, it doesn't happen that often. But I even said it to a manager one time on a Saturday team. I said, try this for a couple of months. Every time an offside, especially in a, a single referee game, Get your player to run by the referee and go, Jeez, I don't know how you spotted that, but well done. Yeah. I was only off by a bit. I'll get the next one. And eventually, be all, and again, those decisions are close on and off. And by the end of the season, he said it to me, he said, you'd be amazed at how many goals we got out of close off to his decisions. Do you, so, do you, what, what do you think going to, what can we do to change that outlook on referees and well, for a start, clubs, I think there needs to be late liaisons with the clubs. As for you a said, start, yeah. in, on a grassroots level, I think it needs, every time there's a formation meeting at the Leinster Senior League, and I can only speak for that, um, it needs to be told to everybody involved, look, you do realise we don't have multiple angles, we don't have replay, and also maybe some of the more senior refs liaising with clubs, explaining stuff. But I'd like to see... Um, I'd like to see com- a, a com- relationship be built with... Referees and clubs. Yeah, come and do a seminar and on it or something. Mm. Get, get the whole club to sit down. Like obviously, like this, this school boy, get them to have a chat, talk to the decisions. Ma- I think mainly probably on on a senior level, it'll probably be a walk better, wouldn't it? Because no, the likes of the kids if, if, and things like that. But if you start them young, and then by the time they get the seniors, 
they've had that respect they've for the others and more. Yeah, you yeah, trade yeah. those seniors, the seniors are just going to be having made the hormones made up already. They're like, fuck that. Mm. You'd yeah. also, you'd also have to get the, the main overarching body to look at that. The FAI. I mean, they, they put a lad in charge of the uh, referees section in, in there and he's doing great work. Like, he sends out these modules constantly. He sends out little clips of what would you have done here? And he's doing Rob Hennessy. He's doing great work in the FEI. Where I feel they fall down is when shit hits the fan. There's no follow through. Because they don't have the drop the drop down. Like international, we have uh, UEFA and FIFA governing bodies. But when you, let's say, Leicester Senior League, if something happens in an FEI Cup type match, so intermediate, junior, and you report it to the FEI, they give out a sanction. Nobody polices that sanction. So I got abused after a match in the Intermediate Cup in a dressing room by a manager where he was forcibly removed from the dressing room. See the line there now when you're talking about abused, yeah. um, Brian. Where, where, does they, where does that come from? Uh, does, there's a line obviously between somebody being a, a bit of a mouthy yeah. fucker to you. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. When, when the abuse starts coming, what, what does that entail of? Do you for and your and so your it's, very, it's very subjective in that you have to actually have the experience of receiving uh, dissent to a degree, abuse. There's ten lines. Like you know when someone says to me, Ah, oh, for fuck's sake, yeah. referee. Yeah. There's nothing in that. But when someone growls at you, for fuck's sake, referee. Now that's in an with, aggressive that's manner. That's with intent. Yes. And again it's subjective. It's how you feel it. So I've seen referees send fellas off where you're kinda of saying, Well actually, you could have dealt with that a little bit better. Now, that's not to say that I'm the judge and, and jury on it. But you have to set your standard. And as I said earlier, <clears throat> they knew my standard. And nobody, very few people, fucked with it. Now, some people are very willing to. A couple of reasons for that. It's if there's no punishment after, you're free to do what you want. Right? Uh, one manager that over the past 16 years when I've been refereeing, I've been involved in 30 fixtures where he's been removed from the ground. He's still... Still involved in a club. Um, Tory <coughs> fixtures, Tory been fixtures where I've officiated, he's been removed. So, and I've so been here an assistant, right? So I don't know what else is his, is his manner, right? That guy who came to my dressing room, he got a ban from the FEI. And what, the f- what exactly did he do? So, like, for the. For oh, the came in, was kicking, like, basically kicked the door in and told me I was a fucking wanker and you hadn't a fucking. What were you doing? And I'm breaking me bollocks and you're fucking this. <clears throat> One of his arguments was about a second ball being on the pitch. But again, he'd obviously, they'd lost the match. It's very rarely the winning manager comes in and does that, you yeah, know. Yeah. But he'd lost the match and I understood the, the aggression and the passion. But he got he got a ban from the FEI, right? No one polices that. The next week, now he was banned as in, you can't be there uh, two hours before and an hour after the game. He was at every game after that. Mm. So there's no policing of it. Another incident where I had... Uh, but abuse in about the 15 minute, a big game. It's about 300 people at the game. Abused, like, called every name. And I went over, red carded the manager. He continued his abuse all the way around the pitch. And everybody in the whole pitch area heard it. He went, I told him to go to the dressing room. He came out of the dressing room about two minutes later to add another bit into the injury. So I reported him for the red card for the original offence. Or the partner for the abuse as he walked around. So that's a second red card. And then the abuse at the door, having gone in and left the field of play, comes back out. So that was three red cards I was sending in. Dressing room, knock on the door at the end of the match. Uh, Brian, can I have a word with you? And I said, yeah, no bother. He says, uh, in private. And I said, no, no, and you have to say is between me and the, tra- the, the Travis. He says, look, I'm really sorry. That's banging our character. He says, eh, I'm so sorry. He says, look, I'm very stressed with life and all that. I said, well, fair enough. I said, um, we all have problems in our lives. I said, but um, I said, it'll be reflected in the report. I put in that you, oh, you're not fucking sending in the report, are you? <laughs> I said, of course I'm sending in the report. After that abuse, then that's, finally that's, gets his head That's my head. job. I said, but I will <laughs> soften it at the end by saying he was very remorseful. Yeah, and I yeah. truly believe that he was remorseful in the dressing room afterwards. And the next words out of his mouth is one of the reasons why we have a problem. He says, I was sent off last week and the referee said he wouldn't put in the report and he didn't. Yeah, so he thinks he gets three shots. So where we've nowhere to go with that. Yeah. Yeah. As referees, right, I'm relying on the other guy the week before. And then if I arrive and my standard is up here and the other guy was down here, 
what message is that given to the players? Yeah. So you all the time have this in the back of your mind. Like, what did the last fella do? Did he report it? And now, I didn't at the time. But he says to me, such and such didn't send in the thing. And I went, so I'll have to report that as well. Yeah. Now, I would have been gimping out the other fella. But I did have a word with him over it. Because he should have sent in the card. Even if you give a card in error. When you rescind it, you still send the report into the league. And that's that's where we... Whether you have time to reflect or not, you can send but, it in but, and then think but we're and go not, again. But we're not the best in that we're not helping each other. So like, if the referee is doing his job, if everybody had that standard, I guarantee you very quickly the abuse would start to drop off. So we are part of causing but also trying to solve the problem. Yeah. When I say we... Any referee that's refereeing now, and if you listen to this, the main thing I would say is do your job, do your reports. That's what you're paid to do. And then if the legislators, like the lads in the Leinster Senior League Committee, they've been fantastic to me over the years. I had so many hard times where they, they stood by me and helped me. They are there to do their job, but if they're not given the, the information and they don't have the tools, how can they fulfil that role? So a lot of referees have to be a little bit wary of if you allow that to happen then it escalates to the next level and then before long they'll put a saddle on you and ride you mm. you know and i'd like to think that every referee goes out and does their job but i know from experience that not everybody does and it's about catching them fellas you know do the job professionally this episode is brought to you by o'connor cars don't let car troubles slow you down Turn to the motor experts at O'Connor Cars for fast and reliable service that gets you back on the road in no time. We all know the frustration of unexpected breakdowns. That's why their team are here to fix any issue, big or small, with precision and care. From engine tune-ups to brake repairs, transmission fixes to diagnostics, they do it all. For reliable motor repairs, call O'Connor Cars on. 01-834-0938 or contact them via Instagram or Facebook at O'Connor Cars. Do you think I'm going to go back into a refereeing at all or as some aspect or as an assessor or something? I, I've been asked a couple of times am I going to go back. At the moment it's a big no. Right. right. Uh, as regards being an assessor I do go out I do go out and have a look at people and again if I'm, I often get a phone call what did you think and I give them an honest opinion but on a formal basis no because if you take up a role as an assessor you can't go out and turn up with someone else distracting you and at the moment I've an 11 year old young fella one of the bigger reasons that I decided to give up the referee was uh, I wanted to give him more time I just noticed that like Saturdays were gone. Yeah. You know, you'd be getting a one o'clock kickoff. So you have to leave the house at 11 to be there for 12 to do the match at one. You're not out of there till half three, four o'clock. You're home. So that's tea time. You know, like that's your whole day. And since I, I retired or stepped down, I've spent nearly every Saturday having daddy boy days. Yeah. You know, daddy, daddy. Or going off and doing stuff. And that's what it's all about, isn't and, it? And, and, and let's be honest, I won't have him for long because he's 11. Yeah, you'll, like, you'll lose him in the By the time he's 14 or 15, will he want to see me or look yeah, at me? Yeah. And he went through so, such a tough time in his early years that, like, I, I, I was so dug into the Leinster Senior League as a referee that maybe I let him down a little bit. So to give that back to him now, and it's even great, and I, I know a lot of lads wouldn't admit to this, but I love spending time with my missus. Mm. So actually, the, the fact that on a Friday night, I can be at home rather than going down to Arklow <coughs> on a wet and windy October mm. evening yeah. to ref a match, to come home with a few bob that, like, it, it was, do you know what, the few bob say, I, I might go out for the dinner, I might go down to a, a, a place with the young flat and have a few yeah, burgers and chips or whatever. that free time that you have is precious. <coughs> the free time is worth way more than that 50 quid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was one of the other reasons why, you know, I just, I'd had enough there's only so many times you can be kind of knocked and called a fat cunt. And like the the second last game I did, <clears throat> I'd already made my mind up I was going to pack it in two weeks after. And then I did an intermediate cup on the Sunday, which was Fingless against uh, Carragher Lion. That was my last game. And I thought when that match was over, I said, that's it. It's time to go. It's time to go. The Saturday, a nothing decision in the box. And the whole bench abused me from a height. When I turned back, Nobody was talking. So 
had to go up to the manager and I said to him, look, what, what was thrown out there? You know, every F and B was thrown out. That's a red card offence and you carry the can for the team. I said, but I'm going to be nice. I'm going to get you yellow card. You control your dugout now for the rest of the game and I won't bother you again. You're having a fucking clue, he says. To <laughs> now, I'm after giving him the benefit of the doubt. So, red card and then he wanted to try and abuse me on the way around and you know what? I had an assessor at that game and after the game, uh, again, it was Victor Lockman was the assessor. I love him to bits. He was a really great guy to me, helped me out in me little tough times. And I just shook his hand, didn't tell him I was resigning, but said, Victor, thanks for everything. And I really appreciate you being here today. It's a really special moment to spend with you. Thanks very much. Didn't tell him. And he went, oh, yeah, no, he was just delighted to be given. The, and I got me a report on the, the Monday. And again, very happy with the report. But on the Sunday... Uh, when I walked out of the dressing room, the two lads had just finished up with a great game, Fingless against Carrigaline, the intermediate. Now, sadly, Carrigaline won that one. Yeah, we were beaten. Yeah. But, uh, I walked that was out. your last game, wasn't it? <coughs> yeah. So the oh, one yeah, yeah, over there. So up in Blanche. Blanche, 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 Blanche yeah, I remember that, yeah. Honestly, I walked out of that dressing room, my bag on my shoulder. Last game, there yeah, you go. I went out, bag on the shoulder, and I was smiling. Yeah, I happy. Out. Yeah, I, I knew it. I knew it was done. Mm. Look at relief, look at weight off the shoulders, was it? Huge weight off the shoulders. Just that expectation of next week, another Friday, another two Saturday and a Sunday. Yeah. And just that weight. It was great. Oh, yeah, yeah actually, it was very good. And even my missus said it to me over the next few weeks, she says, you've just been smiling yeah. and happy. Yeah. And I think everything comes to an end and you have a time. And I think that was it. It's the same as a player, isn't it? When yeah. you're a player and you start dreading going to matches, dreading going to training, being around, that's when they just go. Yeah. yeah. Just jacking yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have to be, you have to be enjoying what you're doing. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. otherwise, you're doing the wrong things. You know, I always look at fellas who are unhappy in their job or, you know, unhappy in their life. And if it was to, be, if it was to be a life coach, I tell fellas, look, do yeah. what fucking makes you happy. happy exactly. Because mm. yeah. like, I still feel like I'm twenty odd. Yeah. Look, I had me fiftieth this year. It won't be long till I'm retiring, and then you know. Yeah. Your time is running yeah, out. Yeah. Don't don't waste it. And I love Definitely. when lads have had a good career and now the time to step away. Yeah. Because you see lads now, they're going down the divisions and they're hurting themselves and they're fucking plastered up and, Mm. you know, it's just, it's it's a beautiful game. I love it to bits. Uh, I'm enjoying going and watching one or two games. That's great that you're still... Because I can bring Mike with me. My uncle comes with me. Now he's bouncing off the railings and he's jumping around and he's having the crack. he's He's happy. But I don't have to worry about making a decision. I don't have to worry about the responsibility that's on your shoulders. Because I do realise the effort that goes in by players and yeah, of course. I respect that because I was once that player who wanted to make it big I had dreams like everybody in football but sadly I was just a bit mental and, and it didn't go that way you know <laughs> jumping out of balls yeah, yeah, the balls yeah. I regret that one to this day brilliant you're going, yeah. you're going to the start of the force and if you go any, any regrets uh, yeah that I didn't uh, get out of it a little bit sooner right the best player you reft best player I ever reft was uh, Martin Kramer his name always pops up. Yeah, he he was phenomenal. Up. And I'll tell you why I loved him. Uh, he was unpredictable with how good he was at turning and playing a ball. Now, James Lee, who would have played in the same team, um, James Lee, you could predict what James Lee was doing. I could always tell what way to run with James Lee. I always knew what James Lee's pass was being. And again, as, a, as a, an ex-footballer, I like to think I could have read the game. But with Kramer, you never, you could never tell whether he was turning left or right. He turned people inside out. And then one thing I loved about him, he never hit me with a ball. I've been hit a few times by James Lee. Now, again, it's probably me. It's so, probably me getting in the so way of it. You obviously didn't know which way he was passing the ball, did you? But I'd make a run and yeah. then all of a sudden, bang, you know, you'd be getting caught. And again, it's down to your positioning. Yeah. But with Martin Kramer, like, balls have whizzed by my head from him. But just a phenomenal player to watch. I used to go out in the middle of the park and enjoy watching him. I'd have paid. I'd have actually not taken a match fee to watch that man mm. play. And in later parts of my career, when he'd stopped, uh, we used to, myself and Deco used to go down and do a few runs with him and stuff and a few things during lockdown, which was great. And he's a, de- he's a decent chap. Never gave me any hassle on the park. Mm. Never. You know, next one. The best manager you ever you had to walk with, like ref or who, who, was, who was one of the good ones? Best manager I ever walked with or, or, or loved. Uh, I, even though he was always very vocal on the sideline and a, a, a bit overly involved it was down to passion was Gary Howler no. loved uh, loved turning up to Gary Howler because you never he's you never, a gentleman you never really knew 
what way it was going to go with him as in he always had a good old battle with you as a referee and there's a couple of times when I had to have a good old chat with him but it was never badness in him in my mind I always enjoyed him uh, I always enjoyed John Scott yeah I mean John Scott for his first few years as a manager I mean he was he was more times out than he was in as regards the the, the sending offs and, stuff. Cares, and again it was our it was our passion at one, one stage he got a six month ban and we referees started calling him Sandy because he was going to be back at Christmas <laughs> you know and again I, 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 I really liked the guy and in fairness to him uh, my young fella got sick when he was three years of age and he was one of the first people to ring me and ask me was I alright? Did I need him? Very good, yeah. Him, Martin Lochran, they all like all the top guys. And it, it shows the type of humans. The class, have. yeah. Yeah, there's a bit of class, class there. Whereas there's some fellas they if they had your number, they'd have deleted it, you know. But uh I I loved I loved and I again I was sort of coached a bit in Shelburne with Gary Howley. He was on that fast course. And again, great, great football and guys yeah. to have played in an FA yeah, Cup yeah. final. Just only a few people get to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The most menacing player you reft. Menacing player you reft. What do you mean by menacing? Now? As in someone that just kept at you, kept at you. Oh, kept at me, kept at me. Oh, oh, scrappy do. Div- scrappy do. Danny Lockram. Danny. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, listen, I, I bumped into Danny a few times over my career and we've had one or two well uh, battles on the pitch. But he, <laughs> he was like, you know, he was like, he was like a bumblebee in a jar. Yeah. He just never went away. You know, we'd be swatting him and doing your best. He just never stopped. Um, and for such, like, he's, he's not that big of a fella. He he, he got stuck in in the game, yeah. and I, I love that passion. Danny the good. Now, he could have a little bit of a, a, a bite as well on the pitch, but mm. I, I, I thought he was constant, constant, constant. And he was a fella played with UCD. Um, big, tall fella played centre half, grey hair, Stevie. Stephen something. But if you didn't card Stevie, he'd just keep in your fucking ear. So half the battle was to Shut see up. when that first yellow. Yeah, was deserved, and, and, and then you know he's what? Your man from uh, UCD, uh, that the manager, I can't think of his name just now. He'd nearly be happy when you get me yellow because yeah. I met Stevie. He'd be concentrating on the game, you know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, he was he was another one of them in the year. But I don't think I don't think there's any badness in Stevie, you know. Yeah. Um, best club. That's a tough one. Best club I played with. I absolutely loved my time at Markovic Celtic. Loved it. All the lads that I played with were from the flats. Pierce House, Margovic House, um, Pierce Street. I, I absolutely loved that time because, again, I was coming in from Tala and, again, I wouldn't have had any knowledge of the flats. My dad would have through his childhood, but I used to love going into Margovic House. That was where we stripped. Yeah. Right in the centre of the flats, we had a, a, a dressing room. The atmosphere was great. Played with some wonderful people down there and I still to this day see some of them they're still involved in football and some of them actually the Margovic over 35 won a, a cup there two years ago and there was still four of the lads I played with on the oh, over good, 25 yeah. side so me, me favourite club to have played for would have been Margovic so. we, we do uh, then one best club or your favourite club as a as a ref to go to, to go on manage uh, to go on ref uh, I the most always, respectful yeah. the yeah, most yeah. respectful so they all have their ups and downs over the years but one thing I did like is when you went to a club and your dressing room was clean, it was kitted out right, and I had either a bottle of water, Lucas Aid Sport, or a few Jaffa cakes or whatever. It just showed a bit of respect. So a lot of clubs did that, but the one I can think of that always did it was Home Farm. Always, when you went into the dressing room, they had set it out. And when John Han took over, I really enjoyed my time any time I went out to Home Farm. Good man, John, yeah. Very good. Your favourite memory? A football. A football. Football. Um, I, I, I think my favourite memory was uh, me and Deco Troy being sent down to the Michael Ward Trophy, the competition between the, the provinces. Um, I didn't really know Deco before that, but we roomed together for that whole tournament, and it was a whole four-day package. We drove everywhere together. We, spe- we, we shared the same room. We had the same dinners, and we got to know each other really, really well. And to this day, he's still he's still one of my best friends. Close friends, very good. So yeah, um, players that didn't fulfil their potential. Oh, players that didn't fulfil their potential. There's so many of them, but there's loads of lads that could have been absolutely world class. Um, there's one player that I, I I still love to this day, and every time I see him, he gives me a hug. Um, I see him regular enough because I go around and in fairness you'll catch him at several clubs because he's fucking transferred that much but Hoppy 
<laughs> Stephen Kinch. Um, I thought he was one of the most exciting players in the Leicester Senior League. But again, just had that spark in him to play unbelievably well. I found as he got on in the in the club years, there was a few mistakes he made along the way. And there was times when he kind of would have gone in on things and been a bit naughty. Uh, but I just thought he was a wonderful footballer and I like him as a person. I again every time I see him, he gives me a big handshake and a big hug. And he's one of the he's one of the nice fellas that I deal with in the in the league. I'm not sure how every referee would feel about him, but I really like him. Yeah. Very good. Um we go into your best eleven, so best eleven. Can I name a best eleven? So in goal, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now uh best goalkeeper, um, that I've I've refereed would have been Dave Mayne. Mean are you? For Crumlin. Um really good, commanded his area really well. Had that little streak of madness like most goalkeepers, but it was always controlled. Now I don't know whether he liked referees. Most times when you were on the pitch with him, he didn't. But I think that was just his professionalism in the way he played. Just the way he had to And I seen I seen him make so many good saves that uh, yeah he he would be the type of goalkeeper that I would have if I was to pick a team and manage a team. So uh, brilliant. He, yeah. Mino was actually when coming to the end of his kind of playing days when I first got the Crumlin. So he was second choice keeper yeah. but he was only there yeah, yeah. to help. Yeah. He had done all his stint, he'd done everything, he won everything. Yeah. And he was still would have probably played with any team in that top league. I think he always had no high problem. standards for himself. Always, and yeah. That is what stands mm. out from him, you know. Yeah, no, he was brilliant. We played the Metro final and Mikey Quinn was our obviously our number one and he was basically learning off Mina. Yeah. Mina was kind of helping him out through the whole season and, and Mina was slowing down with playing and, and happy to be in the dressing room being there as a as an experienced player and it got kind of towards the, the end of the season I think might you might, might have been away you were at the being beaten in the intermediate final and we had the Metropolitan final about two weeks after it and Mina played hadn't really played too much and got man of the match saved two penos and scored the winning penal unbelievable yeah, yeah. stuck the thing into, yeah. into the bottom corner and I saved, remember that run, saved yeah. Andy McNulty Andy McNulty stepped up the, yeah. the two keepers had to the take bear. And he, he smacked on him. I mean, I saved it, yeah. Won the Crazy. game for us and then scored the winner. Crazy. Ran off. And then partied back in his gaff then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Um, my Roy Fall would be Rusty. Off Rusty. Bluebell. Off Bluebell. I can't think of the chap's real name, but Rusty never spoke to you, never got involved, mm. got stuck in. Now, I know he had a bad old... He got uh, a bad leg break bad in that final. leg break, yeah. Yeah, the, the game was... A um, but... <clears throat> He, he, he was great for pace great for playing it and again referees love players they don't give them any hassle and I just thought he was quality and then my two centre halves I'd always go with my two centre halves at Margaret Celtic uh, John Mullen and Noly Bollard Noel Bollard was nuts he was out of Sandwich Street in, in town but he was away with Coventry for a few years but he like Man. One, one of the best ones ever we were out in um, we were out in Darndale and uh, we were in the middle of a match and the referee was feeling the pressure because you'd Markovic against Darndale and we were having an old good old set to. And as the player walked by, the referee was over to the left, the player walked by, now he's to the right and he goes, you can't call the referee a bollocks. <laughs> and the referee, what? And he took out the red card. Did he? Yeah. <laughs> and sent them down to 10 men. Your man never opened his head. <laughs> but it was the way Nowley sold it and Nowley was just brilliant. Yeah. Um, he was just yeah he was a head case but I loved him again as a goalkeeper very rarely did I have to do anything with crosses because they were, they were they were giants in the air and again few old long range shots sure I'd stop them all day you know uh, my left full would be um, who's my left full uh, Ozzy Kenny so Ozzy Kenny was a lad again who played out of Charlemagne Street he was Markovic Celtic player uh, always laughing always joking just ran all day long crazy legs is what we call them he used to go up and down the, the line and uh, more times than not as a left full he was up in the box he was just that gangly and mad great guy um, in front of him there was a fella called Ken Lester again he's actually a fireman in the job now Ken in his prime was unbelievable uh, into me midfield I'd have definitely uh, Martin Kramer and then I'd probably play three in the middle. I'd have Martin Kramer. I'd have Chambers or Callister. 
and I'd Good have play. I'd have James Lee if I could put a uh, tape over his lips um, and get him to concentrate 100% on his football he, could, he couldn't like, that, that was just him wasn't it it's just it, that's the way he had to was, play what did I say to him I said to him one time uh, he was giving me a bit of now again good banter uh, uh, when he was a manager I told him he was my second favourite player ever in the Leinster Senior League and he kind of smiled and went really and I said yeah he said who's your favourite I said everybody else <laughs> Just to have the crack with him, you know. But I, I see him by his smile that, you know, I, I really like James as a player, but by God, was he hard work. Mm. Now, I never really reffed him as a manager of Crumlin. For some reason, never got Crumlin games for the last two years. I don't know, did he ask for me to be removed from the, Could have been. the line-up or whatever? But, uh, nah, listen, it is what it is. And then I'm going to go another old school, uh, right side of midfield, come striker, uh, a guy called Kenny Gregg. Again, out of the flats in town but this man used to turn up with his boots in a plastic bag he had no football and gear whatsoever just boots in a plastic bag and we'd have to give him shin pads and socks and a few bits but he would just be phenomenal he was what a right winger cutting in who did you play time. with him with? Uh, Markovic again yeah. like that's, that was one of the best teams so it's really hard to see those players as anything you. but that mm-hmm. good you know and then me two strikers I definitely have Hoppy in there Hoppy on his good day scores unbelievable goals. He's mad. Why doesn't Hoppy stick around with a club? I've I, never seen you know him finish I don't a, know. a season it, with one club. I don't know whether he just gets itchy or he, bored or what, he what gets it? bored maybe very easily. But listen, I, I only seen him there the other week and he's with another new club. Uh, I just thought he scored some of the best goals I've ever seen. The control, the movement, cutting in. Great. And then the other striker that I'd have up there would be uh, Alan McGrail. Al up top. Never seen a fella being able to control a ball mm. as well as him. Who would you put in? Who would you put in as manager? Huh? Who would you put in as manager? Um, manager wise, I'd probably put Pete Lennon in. Mm. I'd probably put Pete Lennon, but again, for good control and actually the old sort of not talk and not really the demeanor hugely. of him. Yeah, mm. I liked. Uh, Pete used to get involved in the training sessions at the start from the time I went up there and he was all about the football and that's what I loved about me loved good good football now at times on the sideline he was a little bit shouty and that but I don't think there was never badness in him I don't think I ever had to uh, card him or send him off there was just loads of passion and I think as that was my first foray into senior football and to see the way he ran that dressing room everything was right you walked in the gear was hung up the lady in that part of the cabin the big log cabin they had up at the golden ball he'd have that all organised it was clean and warm and comfortable and then the sandwiches were ready afterwards it was proper it was like he was running a professional thing and that was 29 years ago maybe around that you know maybe a little bit longer yeah so brilliant manager. Yeah, very good that's, that's us that was it that's us that was great, yeah. yeah no thanks appreciate it thanks, listen, thanks a million thank lads you. really appreciate it and I hope thanks, that actually going forward that just any sort of uh, people listening to this would look at referees in a slightly different uh, light because we are human and we're not there just for the few bob we're there to actually help 22 lads great, and great. possibly it's 50 get through a game of ball it's great insight into, into obviously your point of view though so it's a double my eyes a lot so good, hopefully good, people brilliant. that's yeah, the same yeah. and listen the best of luck with this I love Cheers, it thanks, I love I'll keep listening and uh, I'll be still out there watching the games Cheers, we'll come and see us play our last few <laughs> 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 you're not watching me play football you're not watching me